This panel is entitled From Politics to Protest. Um, so I'm going to start off just by giving a very quick introduction about Platypus very quickly before I read some of the bios and then the prompt and then we start the panel. So the Platypus Affiliated Society, established in December 2006, organizes reading groups, public fora, research and journalism focused on the problems and tasks inherited from the old 1920s to 1930s, the new 1960s to 1970s, and post-political 1980s to 1990s, left for the possibilities of emancipatory politics today. And just to um, introduce our panelists tonight, I'm going to read um, their, uh, oh, I just missed it, hold on one second. Okay, I'm going to read their bios first. This is not in the order of the presentation, but I just, this is on the order of the website, that's why I'm choosing this. Um, Sean KB is a longtime rank and file member of the New York City District Council of Carpenters and a co-host of the Antifada, a podcast about history, current events, and political economy from a communist perspective. His intermittent writings can be found at seankb.substack.com. Then we have Carl Hoffman, uh, is a member of the Interventionist Left, which is an association of radical left-wing groups and individuals from the undogmatic and emancipatory left in German-speaking countries. The IL has been active for over 20 years in socialist, anti-racist, feminist, and climate struggles, and are committed to anti-fascism and anti-war politics. Their practice ranges from transformative organizing in tenant struggles to campaigns of mass civil disobedience against coal mine. Then we have Howie Hawkins, sitting right here, um, is a retired Teamster in Syracuse, New York, who has been active in movements for civil rights, peace, labor, and the environment since the 1960s. A co-founder of the U.S. Green Party in 1984, he was the party's candidate for U.S. president in 2020. And then we have Carlos Rita. Yeah. Yep. Is a co-founder of Midwestern Marks and writer currently working on a serial anthology of American socialism. So I'm going to read a quote, then I'll read the prompt, and then we will begin uh, right after. So this is a quote from Bhaskar Sankara from 2011. Movements can get politicized. No broad movement emerges out of an apolitical era and latches immediately onto some sort of unified and comprehensive critique. A new politics will emerge, in part, from the cauldron of occupation. But real debates, the clash of ideas, beyond just rosy, impressionistic reports from the front, are required now more than ever. So that was a quote from Bhaskar, I'm going to read the prompt and then the questions. Um, since 2020, the left has undergone a transformation in organizing and self-conception. With the end of the Bernie Sanders movement, the lifting of COVID restrictions, and political disorientation under the Biden administration, horizons for the contemporary left have shifted to street politics, taking up popular discontents with racism, climate change, and American foreign policy. This recalls images of the past, not only of the late 60s and 70s, but the early moments of the millennial left, born out of Occupy, the anti-war movement, and the shadow of anarchism in the 1980s and 1990s. So the questions are, how should today's left consider this history, and what resonance does it have, if any, with the current moment? How have the politics of protest been impacted by the Biden administration and the looming specter of Trump? Are the horizons of possibility for the left today greater than they were 10 years ago? So I think we start with Cora. Okay. Hello, hello. Hello. Hi. Hi, I'm Cora from the Interventionist Leftist, so I'm really glad to be here today. And yeah, I'm going to start. So, are we ever going to learn from history's lessons? That's a question that we as the IL, a non-dogmatic organization of left radicals with like a loose Marxist awareness, have been asking ourselves quite recently again, which is why I was also really grateful for the invitation to the panel. After over 20 years of practice, we've been looking back at our work as what you guys at Platypus call 
the millennia left, and our awesome doubt if we actually managed to overcome what we set out to do. So back when we started in 1999, we were explicitly trying to learn from the failures and the successes of the new left in Germany, and also its anarchist heritage in the late 90s. In opposition to an atomized left that was defined by the autonomous, and K groups, we felt the need to find common grounds again and try to facilitate common discussion and strategic alliance orientation and practice. The new left had a lot to learn from, though. Uh, the operaise movements in Italy and the hot autumn of 1969, the organized workers and non worker strikes, showed that autonomous action could cause a crisis of hegemony in an entire country. They actually showed us what fighting can look like. Relating this back to the present moment, the worker strikes that we have now, at least in Germany, are contained by the workers' unions that have to ensure social peace. And even though we as an extra parliamentary left are working together with unions as well, there seems to be little but actually no revolutionary leeway to it anymore. Another remnant of the new left resurfaced in our beginnings as millennial left when we decided to, contrary to the K groups at the time, not just blatantly focus on the so called working class as a revolutionary subject. Instead, we decided to lean into post Marxist theories by getting involved in the multitude of struggles that actually meet people in their day to day life, like tenants and care struggles. So, forming broad alliances that connect political as well as thematic differences, and also using mass civil disobedience as a tool, we set out into the 2000s. So, what could go wrong? In hindsight, Blockupy was the most successful of these aspirations. Instead of like a ragtag or a group of advocates, it was a coalition of over 90, uh, 90 leftist radical groups in Europe that made mass civil disobedience palatable to the masses again, and was what some even call an international class struggle. Also, socialist party politics seemed to be possible again, recalling Podemos, Syriza, and in Germany, the left party. Back then, we as the IAN supported these projects, but when Syriza bowed to the Troika, it was the start of the end to the last leftist moment in Europe. To us, it showed again that socialist parties in the 21st century are very likely to be pressured to see to the state and the existing capital conditions, even though we find it very honorable to try it out. This is a lesson that has repeated since then, looking at the Bernie Sanders movement and the failure of the DSA. The left party in Germany has shambled to pieces in the last few years, even in the former socialist parts of East Germany. And even though we work together with them, we think that a strong movement outside of electoral party politics is necessary. Still, there's treasures to be found in 2015. Um, movements like the Commune of Europe or the Transnational Social Strike, a project that worked from an anti-European Union perspective, but stress the importance of international bottom-up movements. We didn't see the importance back then, but we kind of hope the Zoomers do now. Um, also nowadays, we're reinvesting in these projects again. So since 2015, the right has dominated the discourse with anti-immigration sentiments, and the left has also failed to come up with alternatives, being caught up in the constant dilemma of having to defend liberal values against a regressive authoritarian project and at the same time criticizing what is done in their name, looking at like the war in Iraq, for example. But in this constant downturn of 2015, we did have a few successes, though. One of our climate projects, Endeglander, I don't know if you guys have heard of it, it's probably not, still a very small German movement, um, is an alliance that managed to get over 7,000 people to block coal mines yearly since 2016 in a campaign of mass civil disobedience. Our goal was to change the discourse and be an investment risk to fossil fuel companies. Looking back, we managed to intervene the hegemony and the discourse level, but we only had very few materialistic wins. 
the climate movement in Germany propelled the neoliberal Green Party into parliament, and we wonder if we're partly responsible for that. Also, by trying to make civil disobedience possible for the masses, we ended up going from being an investment risk to actually a calculatable factor for police and the state, which really sucked. Um, and, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Yeah. Also, another problem showed up in this goal of forming broad alliances. By trying to connect everyone for the autonomous, to broad civil society, essentially forming a majority, we sometimes lost our profile of being leftist radicals and kind of turned into like neoliberal project managers. When they constantly try to provide structure, awareness, moderate plenaries, the radical stance that points to the larger goal of socialism beyond single issue activism just gets lost. Um, but our experience has shown as well that it's important to have a dialectic approach to, to these broad alliances. We've been active in transformative organizing in the past 10 years as well, and have actually managed to organize a majority vote to expropriate housing companies in an ever gentrified Berlin. Here, we forge alliances with a lot of groups that share the goal of affordable housing, managing to move the goalposts from just simple tenant struggles to getting people to ask why private property exists anyway. So, we're aiming for socialization of private energy, housing and agricultural companies as a long-term goal. And it's actually one of the projects that gives me hope. So, what do we take from this? In times of both hate groups and identity politics seem to be on the rise because they're offering easy solutions to complex questions, we feel the need for common grounds is stronger than ever. Quite reminiscent of the early 2000s, the leftist marginalized and split up, but people don't want to have discussions outside of their bubbles. And neoliberalism is also eliminating categories of collectivity and social infrastructure. The welfare state and collective spaces that we as leftists severely need. But not only do we need more common grounds as leftists again, we also need new, or maybe old, strategies, because the political systems we're living in are drastically changing. Our analysis is that the accumula accumulation regimes are changing in the face of climate change, and actually currently they're fighting for hegemony and supremacy. There's what we call the project of green capitalism, which for you guys will be represented probably by Biden. In our case, it would be the coalitions of the Greens, the neo-libs and the social democrats that are now ruling our country. Meaning, liberal bourgeois politics that push green technologies without prompting social change as well. And then, there's a project of regressive authoritarianism, in your case, Trump. And in our case, the right-wing party called the AfD, and parts of the conservative um, party. This one actually wants to cling to fossil fuel capitalism. It promises that everything can stay the same if we need to shut up the state for migration, the globalized world, and cling to patriarchal privileges. And our politics have been impacted by that. The project of bourgeois liberal hope of modernization is taking up but once was radical politics of recognition and weakening their demands so they fit into the capitalist logic of exploitation. A few of the organizations that we want some politics with are not part of this green capitalist project. In turn, we sometimes seem indistinguishable to normal people from the ruling politics. If we advocate for climate politics, it's being seen as us not caring about the socio-economic situation of the affected people. That is also a reason why we feel it's important to emphasize class struggle in our politics again and to make it prominent make it a prominent connection between the various struggles we're part of. On the other hand, the project of progressive authoritarianism makes us more prone to what we call fire department politics. We have to use cheap and dirty methods to prevent worse things from happening, which means choosing the lesser evil most of the time. In your case, I would be voting for Biden, for example. In our case, and the now pretty right wing east of Germany, it's supporting conservative parties in rural areas and then kind of having to call it Antifa. <coughs> <coughs> Embarrassing, I know. Um, <laughs> the regressive authoritarian project makes it harder to create real leftist alternatives. And even though there's bigger protests against the AfD happening right now in Germany, the downfall to this is that the racist values that they are propagating are also present in the other, other parties as well. 
So if we criticize the liberal parties for their own migration politics, we are met with anger from within the protest decrying us as disruptors to the unity of, I don't know, being good and well. <laughs> so the prospects seem pretty damning for our left. Um, that is now post-COVID and at times of neoliberal alienation more marginalized than ever. And in 2015, we faced a similar amount of crisis, but at least we had found a common international answer as leftists. So I would say to your introductory question, um, no, the horizons of the left are smaller than they were 10 years ago, but by emphasizing the class element and the various struggles that we're part of, making rooms for discussions of strategic orientation, and also refocusing on civil society activism, the strategies that actually give me hope. And to quote Rosa Luxemburg finally, those who do not move don't feel their chains. So I, I take the title from protest, or I'm sorry, from politics to protest to refer to people going back to the streets after the failure of the movements around, particularly Bernie Sanders. And for me, that reminds me of an article by Bayard Rustin in 1965 that was opposite. It was called From Protest to Politics. And his argument was, our street politics got us the Civil Rights Bill and the Voting Rights Bill. Now we need to consolidate our power a coalition of liberals, labor, and Negroes in the language of the day. And it would be a permanent majority and make the Democratic Party into kind of a American version of the Social Democratic Party in Germany or the Labor Party in Britain. The strategy was called realignment. And basically you kick the Dixiecrats out of the Democratic Party, let the Republicans have them, but take all the liberals in the Republican Party and you got a majority. That was the strategy, as uh, it was either Irving Howe or Michael Harrington later said, we're talking about the popular front without Stalinism. You know, a coalition of working class and middle class and liberal bourgeoisie, the popular front, uh, would be a permanent majority. Um, it didn't work out that way. The next election, Nixon won. Um, and without going into all the reasons for that, there was also a counter movement, the response to uh, Bayard Rustin from SDS, Carl Davidson, was from protest, not to politics, from protest to resistance. And that was the call for burning draft cards and resisting the draft. And uh, so this took place in 1965 and 1966. Um, and as I said yesterday, I think the new left in that period drew the wrong lessons from the gains they made from street politics around civil rights and the anti-war movement. And that was, we don't need an organization, we don't need a party, we don't need to run our people in elections, we just need to protest like hell, and we'll, we'll win our results that way. Um, I never believed that. I've been part of a smaller current coming out of the new left that said, we need a mass party of the left, uh, which we've never had, except maybe the Socialist Party in the early part of the 20th century. And, I mean, we had the Peace and Freedom Party in 68 and the People's Party in 72 and 76. Barry Commoner running as the Citizens Party in 1980, which Petra Kelly said, that's America's Green Party. But it wasn't. We formed a Green Party in 1984 and began organizing. And then there was the Labor Party in Wazaki. I've been involved in all these efforts. Um, but I'll tell you, the broader movement had either, not knowing where it came from, popular front politics, it's like, We'll be on the street when we got an issue, but when the election comes around, we're going to support the Democrats because the Republicans are worse. I wasn't really thought through, but that was the practice. So they defaulted to the Democrats. So I think that it kind of explains uh, what was going on in the post-1960s period. Um, and the dynamic has been without a mass party on the left. Uh, Socialism, as a political current, lost its independent identity, its organizational ability to speak to masses of people. And the socialists and their little groups would talk to each other about socialism, but when they did practical politics, they were doing the grunt work for democratic liberal candidates. 
I mean, that's what it came down to, and socialism shrunk as an ideology that many people in various forms were thinking about. Um, and I would argue, as I, I did earlier, and uh, was mentioned, I guess, an objection before, we will not have political space for a mass party of the left until we change the electoral system from single member district winner take all to a proportional representation system based on rank choice voting, proportional rank choice voting, rather than a party list system, I think works better given our political tradition. Maybe we can talk about that more uh, in the discussion. But uh, I want to give one example of where I think combination of uh, practical politics with the government, not so much electoral politics in this case, it was town meetings in New England, and street politics, and that's the clamshell lines and I didn't take time. How am I doing on time? Okay, good. Uh, so we had a group we formed in 1976 called the Clamshell Alliance, anti-nuclear. Uh, we occupied a nuclear power plant site at Seabrook, New Hampshire, two smaller occupations in 1976, and then a big one, 1,414 of us arrested at the site, put in National Guard armories for 10 days, it was front page news across the country, put the anti-nuclear movement on the, on the map. And uh, so at the time we did that, 7% of the people in New Hampshire only opposed nuclear power. So what we did next was take resolutions to town meetings. The strategy to build this nuke, which was bigger than anything ever built in New Hampshire, you know, many times bigger than the existing power utility was something called Construction Works in Progress, which is a fee pre-funding this nuclear power plant, which was different than what has traditionally been done, which is the plant doesn't go into rate base until it's up and running and working. So we took this resolution to conservative New Hampshire towns. This was a rock rib Republican state in 1978. And those Republicans said, yep, you know, you hippies are right. You know, we don't want to pay that fee. That's not fair. We don't even know the thing will work. So we won this all across the country. This is 1978. And the Democrat ran against Quip, Construction Works in Progress, and won the governorship. And we got Quip repealed. So what happened? The street actions brought the issue to the public attention. By the time we got through taking these uh, town meeting resolutions to scores of towns up and down New Hampshire, public opinion was now 70% against public power. That's a combination of you know, working in governmental institutions, in this case, town meetings, direct democracy at the local level, you can talk to everybody, and, and they're not compromised like a lot of counselors are by real estate interests in local politics. So it was the street politics, put it on the map, and then we took it into the government and with the people, and we won our, our issue. So to me, that's a good example of combining street politics and electoral politics, although in this sense it was town meetings, which is even better. Um, so I'm saying we need both street politics and a mass left party. And you know, I've, I've spent more time on street politics than I have in electoral politics, even though you know I was involved in all these electoral efforts, helped start the Green Party. And uh, you know, besides the uh, nuclear, any nuclear power, I was involved in any nuclear weapons. Uh, you know, I was part of the Alter Globalization. I was one of those teamsters with the turtles at the battle in Seattle. Um, active in any, any Iraq war movement, what the New York Times called the world's second superpower. Uh, the Occupy movement, which it was American version of the revolutions of the squares, they called them, these mass demonstrations. This is where the new generation comes in. You know, we go to the streets, but uh, in occupied places, but what are the demands? You know, that, that was my question at Occupy in Syracuse. You know, okay, we're here, what do we want? And there was a division between those who said, we don't want anything, we don't want to say what we want, we just want to go through this process of this permanent assembly. And others of us wanted demands. I was, I think I mentioned, I'm reading this book by Vincent Bevins, the If We Burn, the, mass, the Decade of Mass Protests and the Missing Revolution. And he makes a point which resonated with me. And he said, the middle class people at these events, they just want the process. Whereas the working class people want results. And I think that is one thing we need to think about. 
coming out of the period where we didn't have organizations, we were anti-organizational, even anti saying what we wanted. I mean, I'm not sure where that leads, but uh, for working class people, it doesn't lead anywhere uh, that I think can motivate working class people to get involved. Um, so, uh, tell me again, oh, three minutes, okay. Um, well, I, I'll give you one more example, because this is another thing I've been involved in a lot, and that is anti-police brutality stuff. You know, from uh, Rodney King in 1991 and Johnny Gamage, who was killed in Pittsburgh suburbs, he was there with his friend Ray Seals. I knew them. They were from Syracuse and got murdered by the police. To, you know, Eric Garner and Michael Brown in 2014 and, and George Floyd in 2020. And the repeated dynamic there is people are angry, very militant in the streets. And then when it comes, like it did after George Floyd, by the time the fall came around, the, the movement went to the Democratic Party and were demanding local reforms and then the the, what was it, George Floyd, you know, police, something, that bill at Congress, which the House did pass, but it didn't get past the Senate because they wouldn't take on the filibuster, the Democrats wouldn't. And at the local level, it went into local demands, and where are we now? We got Trump, I mean, we got Biden, like Clinton, campaigning on more federal money for more cops on the streets after we had this massive protest in 2020. So again, I think that's what happens when you don't have a mass party or mass organized movement, a mass organizations that are bringing a perspective to masses of people so that uh, we understand that if we rely on the Democratic Party, we're going to get co opted. Um, so, to wrap this up, I would say, you know, the lesson I keep drawing has been missing since the, the coming out of the 60s, and that is a mass party of the left. Now, and I think this was just uh, referenced, you get a mass party, then you got a whole new set of problems. You know, there's the temptation to de-radicalize the program for electoral viability. Um, there's the iron law of oligarchy that uh, Robert Michels talked about in analyzing the Social, Social Democratic Party a century ago. And, uh, but I'm saying we should have those problems. You know, then we will we'll cross that bridge when we get there. Right now, without that party, we don't have a way of reaching masses of people and giving them an alternative because the default position of street politics, all you're doing is lobbying the Democrats. And without a uh, left party threatening to take those votes from the Democrats, they take our street politics for granted and we get very little out of it. So, uh, you know, that's where I come out with uh, particularly the last decade of, you know, revolutions of the squares, but, or, you know, yeah, revolutions of the squares, they come, but really no revolution. Sure, sure, sure. All right, I'm a podcaster, so that's one thing I know how to do. Um, being confronted with the questions for this panel, I found to be really challenging. Uh, I'm not, I don't think, a particularly um, smart political thinker. Uh, I think I have certain things that I am good at. So if this presentation is asked more questions than it provides answers, I think that's maybe the role that I could play here. And I'd like to break down um, my understanding of this problem, this movement from uh, protest to politics and then back um, through both a macro and a micro level. Um, one of the other things I can provide is uh, real life experience, real lived experience uh, on that micro level among uh, groups of people that Howie would be very familiar with, I'm sure, and many of us might be as well, which is um, blue collar union tradespeople um, and what their sense of the world is and what the limitations of our politics might be vis a vis them. But I'd like to start maybe first with the macro uh, because, or you could say objective. Um, the last 15, 16, 17 years have been typified by various political and social reactions to the great financial crisis. Sort of the context of the movements of the squares that were mentioned of your autonomous movements um, and organizing in general and, and mass politics in general, such as they exist in the United States. Um, 
the protest movements that we saw in Occupy Wall Street, as Howie mentioned, were part of a larger cycle of struggles that's been rocketing the world since 2009, 2010, um, all the way from Greece uh, to Spain with the indignados. Uh, recently, we saw France uh, in an uproar over Macron's uh, austerity policies against pensions. We had um, Chile, of course, uh, and the mass protests that led to actually the election of a social democratic millennial president who tried to push through a um, constitutional reform that turned into sort of a grab bag of single issues. Uh, and I'd also include the wildcat strikes in the automotive and steel sector uh, in China um, in the early parts of the teens. So when we say from protest, or from politics to protest, I feel like the Bernie Sanders moment in the United States, and then perhaps you could say the Corbyn um, moment in the UK were brief sort of periods of politics, uh, electoral politics, in between a larger sort of disoriented disconnected um, sort of apolitical or post-political sort of upsurge of working class sentiment around the world against uh, the social order that uh, was sometimes filtered in through an electoral um, sphere, but sometimes wasn't. So in a real sense then, after the Bernie Sanders movement, we have to ask ourselves, what were the real limitations of that moment? What was it that Sanders was running up against? What was it that Corbyn was running up against? And of course it is the lack of a mass party, right? A mass independent socialist party um, of the working class. Well, what were the headwinds for that? And what do we still face today? The limits of course to that uh, then as now are um, political economic. Um, the idea of course, always with these resurgences of a social democratic politics is to bring uh, the national economy somewhere back to, let's say, 1955 or 1956 or maybe the 1960s. The political economy, of course, of global capitalism has changed immensely from that period in time to the point where with all the, um, with all the problems that Trump had pushing through his agenda, agenda as president, we can only imagine what Bernie Sanders would face. This, of course, comes too with the mobility of capital. And I'm not just talking about financial capital, but industrial capital which is now fragmented across the entire globe. Um, large workplaces that once might have had five, six, seven, eight thousand workers, mass workers, uh, and the sort of nucleus of some sort of mass socialist politics are now many, many different workshops spread out, not just across nations, but across, uh, across borders and internationally as well. Uh, you have alongside that, of course, the dissolution of uh, working class communities not just through the uh, process of suburbanization, but also through the fracturing of production from inner city cores into brownfield sites uh, outside of cities. So whereas in my union, for example, everybody was of one ethnicity, they were ethnic whites, and they lived in one particular community in Brooklyn. And so you can imagine the power that that local might have had, uh, not just to do economistic demands, but also have a real like solid core of a working class life. Whereas my local now people are spread out all over the uh, tri-state area, some of them in, in Pennsylvania even. Uh, you have of course too on top of this, uh, the rise of social media uh, and the broader death of civil society. So these are things that uh, confront not just a political movement, but also the protest movements. And maybe the wellspring for why these protest movements have been unable to uh, rise into uh, something more settled than like a cycle of struggles that rockets around the globe all the time. So there's this global valence to the situation that makes us ask, um, is social democracy even possible at this point? And I would answer, no, it's not. And so what happens with the Bernie Sanders movement if it is chasing uh, chimera, chasing something that um, because of the fundamental conditions cannot actually exist? Uh, you end up with um, my micro examples here, right? How I've confronted politics on the job and in the union hall for the last 10 or 12 or 15 years or so. You know, the first person I ever met in my life who was an Elizabeth Warren supporter uh, was a uh, West Indian uh, trade unionist. He was a black man and he was a uh, Elizabeth Warren supporter. The first person I ever met who was a Donald Trump supporter was a Dominican immigrant, first generation 
the only person I really ever met who was a Bernie Sanders supporter was somebody in their late 60s. He was, a, um, he was an operating engineer, a welder, and he would nod towards Bernie Sanders because he remembered the Clintons and NAFTA uh, in the 2000s. Um, the same guy who was a Trump supporter also on this one particular job we had kind of talked himself into reinventing the general strike, right? A highly, highly uh, militant working class guy. On top of that, you know, uh, which is a, a very weird pastiche of different uh, political tendencies of different people that you wouldn't expect. Um, there is, and especially now there is, except for maybe one or two people on the job who are super pro-Trump, um, a real sickness and a real boredom with politics and uh, a wish that they would all just go away. The questions that we ask here don't seem to, to make it down to that level. People are, with, for lack of a better word, drowning right now. As much as the Biden administration is telling us that this is a golden age for the working class, um, all I hear, all I heard here talked about is how expensive housing is. If you have, if you didn't buy a house in the New York tri-state area 20 or 30 years ago, people know they're never gonna have that. How terrible uh, commutes are, how the work conditions get worse every single year, how crime has entered their community in ways that it hasn't before. And there's a real isolation and loneliness out there that I think is so pervasive that it's impossible uh, to ignore. So this begs the question then, how can we imagine a mass socialist party? How can we imagine a party form arising um, under conditions of the death of civil society, but also as the left is completely disorganized and without power and, and unserious, I think, in many cases in the United States, how do we imagine moving forward with the death of the left, right? Which is a, a platypus thesis, which I think is, is very much correct. And the answer to that that I've had is not a return to street politics per se, although interesting things can happen in the streets. Uh, we can talk about some examples later of the way in which uh, street protests have moved into the point of production, even just recently, uh, and how that might alongside some sort of centralized workers' power be a means that we can tactically use uh, to further our agenda. But also I think now too, and there's plenty of examples of this, especially the Chilean example, how do we deal with um, you know, the, the inability to create a mass party in the interim? Um, if civil society is dead, Right? If communities have dissolved, if the preconditions for politics itself are dead too, what is it that we can take from the history of the United States, the revolutionary history of the bourgeois epoch, and try to imagine socialists and the working class ourselves as um, not merely political subjects, but also people who take seriously and have a plan for, as nobody else really does in society right now, to repair and revive civil society in an era when all of capitalist society militates against it. What would a working class civil social organization association look like that could not only repair and rebuild, but also be the necessary preconditions for having a party that could be addressing civil social needs on the one hand, but also the larger political <laughs> demands of the class on the other. And I think this is the important question is, you know, I don't want to shit on Bernie leftists, and I don't want to shit on protesters, for example, who are out there um, calling for a ceasefire in Gaza. But as uh, Howie said, ultimately these protests end up simply being uh, begging the Democrats for better policy or involving ourselves in an internecine struggle within the coalitions that constitute the capitalist Democratic Party. I think that uh, we need to step back maybe even from being political right now and start to become pre-political. Imagine the conditions and possibility that must be present to even begin thinking about forming a, a socialist uh, institution or organization that can be more than a sect under the conditions we're in now. So. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? I'm not the biggest fan of these mics. <laughs> so get quite close. Up. It's basically rapid. Um, but I, I just want to reiterate uh, that I'm very grateful to have been invited to, to speak uh, at, at this panel. Um, are you? Is it? Oh, sorry, a little bit. Is it? Is it? Hello. Yeah. There we go. Please feel free to let me know if, uh, if that's out. Uh, 
The principal question for any socialist movement today, be it in the US or outside, is where it stands on issues of war and peace. What will be its position regarding American imperialism? As the great W.B. Du Bois had long ago noted, quote, the government of the United States and the forces in control of government regard peace as dangerous. The foundations of American society, as it exists under the tyranny of capital, is war. They have built up a grand machinery of lies, pumping out through all mediums the twisted facts and inverted realities needed to support their topsy-turvy narrative of world events and thereby obtain consent for their uh, crimes. They have slaughtered people and allowed whole populations to face the meat grinder of war to defend the right of accumulation for the owners of capital, the monopoly finance capitalist class, to defend the rights of those who have pillaged the world for centuries, those who make a killing out of killing, who trade in the annihilation of life for profit. As everyone knows, wherever there is oppression and immiseration, there will be, sooner or later, resistance. This is a universal law of, hum of all human societies fractured by class antagonisms. It is this dialectic of class struggles which pushes humanity forward, often producing the births of whole new social systems from the ashes of a previous one. But these movements, these moments of societal renewal, where a new class comes into a position of power and creates a world in its own image, are not guaranteed, even if the conditions for producing it are. There is always the possibility, as Marx and Engels had long ago noted, of a ge general societal dissolution. To put it in terms fitting with the contradictions of the capitalist mode of life, it isn't only socialism which stands as a possibility within the embryo of capitalism. Equally capable of actualizing itself is, as Rosa Luxemburg long ago noted, barbarism. The human element, what in traditional communist literature is called the subjective factor or the subjective conditions, are indispensable. It is, does not matter how bad things get, how clearly revolutionary the objective conditions are, without the subjective factor, all is nil. It is the organized masses, led by the most conscious within their ranks, that make, out of the objectively revolutionary conditions, the revolutions. For Lenin and the communist tradition, objectively revolutionary conditions require the presence of a few key factors. One, the worsening of the working masses living conditions. Two, their inability to go on in the old way. Three, their willingness to act, not just passively accept the satisfaction. And four, a crisis in the ruling class itself where even they cannot continue to go on in the old way. These objective conditions are present and intensifying daily in American society. We are faced with the first generation in American history to live lives worse than their parents. Precarity has become a general reality for working people, the majority of whom are lost paycheck away from joining the 600,000 homeless wandering around in a country with 33 times more empty homes than homeless people. Debt slavery has become in our highly financialized capitalism, a generalized reality drowning most working class Americans. Hundreds of thousands die yearly for lacking the financial means to access medical services or overdosing on opioid drugs pushed by the medical pharmaceutical industrial complex in cahoots with the government, the NGOs, and the universities. Social decay is evident as former industrial powerhouse cities are plagued by zombified humans and rusted remains of the industries that once were the basis of decent working class communities. The American dream has become a joke for working class people who have more and more come to realize what the comedic critic George Carlin once said. It's called the American dream because you have to be asleep to believe it. But these conditions, although functioning as the prime matter for, a, for building a revolutionary movement, are not enough. Why is that? I turn to Lenin, who says that, quote, it is not every revolutionary situation that gives rise to a revolution. Revolution arises only out of a situation in which the above mentioned objective conditions are accompanied by a subjective change, namely the ability of the revolutionary class to take revolutionary mass action strong enough to break or dis dislocate the old government, which never, not even in a period of crisis, falls if it is not coupled over. Like Sisyphus, the left of the last two decades seems condemned to roll the rock up simply to see it fall, rinsing and repeating continuously every few years. Since the protest movements against the invasion of Iraq to Occupy Wall Street, to the Bernie movement, to the Black Lives Matter protests, to the current protests against the Zionist genocide, the left has seen itself condemned to pull hundreds of thousands and sometimes even millions into the streets to express anger with whatever injustice is latched onto, only to then, after a few weeks or month, months, have everything returned to square one. I genuinely hope that the protest for a permanent ceasefire breaks this trend. 
But if we are honest with ourselves, what fruit has been born out of the last two decades of protest? Did the Iraq protest stop the invasion and further destruction of the Middle East? Did the Occupy Wall Street protest stop financial speculation and overthrow the 1%? Did the Bernie movement win, the pol win political power and bring about it the much promised political revolution? Did the BLM protest actually challenge policing, the prison industrial complex and the system which has made them necessary? The answer is not only no. The answer is, besides not achieving their desired ends, they have often accomplished quite the contrary. Movements such as Bernie's and BLM, whatever still remains of it, were clearly just absorbed into the liberal and frankly most dominant wing of the ruling class. They became what I've called in my work a controlled form of counter hegemony, presenting the veneer of radicality on what is essentially a bourgeois politics that serves to reinforce the status quo with radical sounding language. Giving up is, of course, not an option. The necessity for struggle is in the air. What do we do then? I think we must start with being open to self-critique. Far too often, even the attempt at doing so will receive backlash from those who are more comfortable with continuing the failures. Marxism is to dogma, dogma as water is to oil. If one is present, the other cannot be, at least not for long. If the tactics of the past have not worked, then it's time to go back to the drawing board and ask, why have the working masses not been won over to our side? Why have all the movements we've led this century ended in disappointments? It is okay to fail, but what is insane is to continue to fail in the same way while expecting different results. When questions such as these are tackled by the dominant left, the blame is almost always placed upon working people. Working people are not enlightened enough, too brute to realize how bourgeois ideology manipulates them, etc. While components of the narrative are true, the question is, so what? What is the point of communists if not precisely to pierce through that, to win the struggle for the hearts and minds of working people, to rearticulate the rational kernels of the spontaneous common sense they've developed within bourgeois, uh, the bourgeois order and rearticulate those rational kernels towards socialism, either producing active militants in the process or the sympathetic mass, mass uh, which it leads. In my view, the chunk of the blame for our failures lies on the left itself, on its middle class composition and the purity fetish outlook it operates with. Therefore, while we find objectively revolutionary conditions in the US, we have a deep crisis in the subjective factor, that is a poverty of revolutionary organizations and their worldviews. Most of the organizations of the socialist left are governed by the professional managerial class, what in the time of Marx and Engels was simply called the intelligentsia. What were supposed to be working class organizations, vehicles for the conquest of political power by this class, have become centers of petty bourgeois radicalism, as Gus Hall once called it. This analysis is not new. Many theorists have pointed out how, since the late 1970s, along with the State Department's attack on communists and socialists and labor unions, and its promotion through programs such as the Congress for Cultural Freedom of a compatible anti-communist left, that the working class left has been destroyed and replaced by middle class radical recuperators, as one of my colleagues, Gabriel Rockhill, calls them. The US State Department, as I show in my work, has been effective in creating this controlled counter-hegemonic left a left that speaks radically, but in substance always allies itself with imperialism. This is far from a condemnation of intellectuals in general, but the reality is that as it currently exists in the US, the dominance of the professional managerial class within socialist organizations is deeply alienating to workers who are less concerned with their middle-class moralisms than with surviving in a declining society. On an ideological level, I have shown that this middle-class left suffers from the purity fetish a worldview that makes them relate to the world on the basis of purity as a condition for support. If something doesn't live up to the pure ideas that exist in their heads, it's rejected and condemned. In essence, it is the absence of a dialectical materialist worldview, a flight from a reality governed by movement, contradiction, and interconnection, and towards a pure, lofty ideal safe from desecration by the meanness of reality. This purity fetish, I argue in my work, takes three central forms in the US. First because a block of conservative workers are too imperfect or backwards for the American left, they are considered baskets of deplorables or agents of a fascist threat. Instead of raising the consciousness of the so-called backward section of the working population, the purity fetish left condemns them, effectively removing about 30 to 40% of American workers from the possibility of being organized. This is a ridiculous position which divorces socialists from those working in the pressure points of capital. The purity fetish left, therefore, eschews the task of winning over workers irrespective of the ideas they hold. In doing so, they simply sing to the choir, that is, to the most liberal sections of the middle classes that already agree with them on all these social issues they consider themselves to be enlightened on. 
The second form the, pur the purity fetish takes is a continuation of the way it is generally present in the tradition of Western Marxism, which has always rejected actually existing socialism because it does not live up to the ideal of socialism in their heads. In doing so, they have often become the leftist parrots of empire, failing to recognize how socialism is to be built. That is how the process of socialist development occurs under extreme pressures of imperialist hybrid warfare in a world so dominated by global capital. In its acceptance of capitalist myths about socialism, this left acquiesces to the lie that socialism has always failed and arrogantly, arrogantly pauses itself as the first ones who will make it work. Instead of debunking the McCarthyite lies with which the ruling class has fed the people, this left accepts them. The third form of the purity fetish is the prevalence of what Georgi Dimitrov called national nihilism. The total rejection of our national past because of its impurities. A large part of the American left sees socialism as synonymous with the destruction of America. Bombastic ultra-left slogans dominate the discourse of many left-wing organizers who treat the history of the United States in a metaphysical way, blind to how the country is a totality in motion, pregnant with contradictions, with histories of slavery, genocide, imperialism, but also with histories of abolitionist struggles, of worker struggles, of anti-imperialist and socialist struggles. It is a history that produces imperialists and looters, but that also produced Du Bois, King, Henry Winston, and other champions of the people's struggle against capital, empire, and racism. This purity fetish left forgets that socialism does not exist in the abstract, that it must be concretized in the conditions and histories of the peoples who have won the struggle for political power. As Dimitrov put it, it must be socialist in content and national in form. Socialism, especially in its earliest stages, must always have the specific characteristics of the history of the people. In China, it's called socialism with Chinese characteristics. In Venezuela, Bolivarian socialism. In Bolivia, it means embedding socialism within the indigenous traditions of communalism, etc. As Kim Il-sung once wrote, what assets do we have for carry on the revolution if the history of our people's struggle is denied? This is effectively what the national nihilists do, rooted in the purity fetish outlook. To put it in philosophical terms, excuse me, this is also a form of liberal tinted American exceptionalism, which says that yes, the whole world has had to give national form to socialism, but we're the exception. To put it in philosophical terms, there cannot be, contrary to the tradition of Western philosophy, abstract universals devoid of the specific forms they take in various contexts. On the contrary, as the Hegelian and Marxist traditions, both rooted in dialectical worldviews, maintain, the universal can only be actual when it is concretized through the particular. In other words, if we don't take the rational progressive kernels of our national past and use them to fight for socialism, we will not only be doomed to misinterpreting the US, uh, US history, but we will fail as we have to connect with our people and successfully develop a socialist struggle in our context. In every instance, the purity fetish of the middle class left forbids them not only from pro properly understanding the world, but from changing it. It is no coincidence that the part of the world in which Marxist theoreticians find everything too impure to support is also the one that has failed, even under the most objectively fertile conditions, to produce a successful and meaningful revolutionary movement. In short, conditions in the US are objectively revolutionary, but the subjective factor is in deep crisis Processes of social change cannot succeed if these two conditions are not united. For the U.S. left to succeed, it must re-centralize itself in the working masses and dispel its purity fetish outlook, replacing it with a dialectical materialist worldview, the best working tool and sharpest weapon, as Engels once uh, pointed out, that Marxism offers the proletariat. It needs a party of the people guided by this outlook, what has been traditionally called a communist party. Although some might bear that name today and tarnish it with decades of fighting for the liberal wing of the ruling class, the substance of what a communist party stands for, what it provides the class struggle, is indispensable for our advancement. It is the only force that can unite the people against the endless wars of empire that not only lead to the deaths of millions around the world, but also to the immiseration of our people and cities who live under a state that always has money for war, but never, for, but never to invest in our people. Only when the people actually come into a position of power and create a society of, by, and for the working people can this fate change. For this, we need an American Communist Party, a People's Party. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentations. Now we'll just have some responses. I just want to bring out a, a theme that I saw that I know, uh, but Carlos and Sean, you were reflecting on the tactics of the last two decades, and um, you know, and how can we learn from the failures? A lot of protests, but kind of maybe no change. And how you had said something similar, but you had linked it to since the '60s, 
right? So that seems to be that this problem has been there since the 60s. And I wanted to bring up Caro, you actually said you felt there might have been more potential 10 years ago or a decade ago. I think right at the end of your, your speech brought that. But I would love to hear responses from everybody, kind of three minutes each. If you want, maybe Carl, would you like to start? Yeah, sure. Um, yes, you can hear me. I can hear myself. Um, thank you, first of all. I found all your inputs very interesting. And um, where do I start? Well, I think what you just said, Carl, is about... Um, I do very highly agree with you that uh, protest politics, and especially the, probably since like the, the 60s, but like especially in like the millennia that have really fed into liberal politics, that it's definitely something that has happened and it's a problem also that people in these kind of protest politics are not willing to have proper discussions anymore, which is also where I highly appreciate platforms for like trying to bring together people to actually have fights again because that is something that we definitely need right now in the time of echo chambers. Um, but I would argue that we actually need these kind of protest politics right now, or as, as we would call it, street politics, because we are definitely not at a moment in time where we can actually fight or build a socialist mass party, just as you just said, um, Sean, that um, we're, as I think Papus calls it, in pre-political times and uh, the element called pre-revolutionary times, there is no basis for actually um, getting people to believe in party politics again. There's a crisis of representation at the moment that I feel that we first need to build up through street politics, through the adrenaline that sometimes even protest, um, protest politics bring us. Um, yeah, so. Basically, I also do agree we do need to build up civil society again, and that also happens through protest politics. And what I was also wondering about is uh, the point that you made, Howie. I think we've just had a bit of a discussion about this earlier on, but um, in Germany we do have a very different party system, and um, we've had a left party since 2007, which um, came out of like communist parties, etc. And um, it's just been majorly disappointing, <laughs> really, for all of us. Um, so every time we try to put effort into these kind of parties, at the moment in time, I don't see possibility for it actually not to just be, I don't know, played by uh, power politics of the system. So um, hypothetically, I would like to ask you, how do we actually prevent these parties? Or yes, the Green Party, like we must have talked about this as well, from becoming neoliberal, from feeding into the system that there already is. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. I think you turned it off. That's it. I think that's it. There we go. Um, well, I started in the 60s because the questions prompted. I mean, I could have gone back to the. 1930s and talked about the crisis of Stalinism, what it did to the left, to the socialist movement, <clears throat> with the show trials, mass famine, uh, or we could have gone back to 19, when was it, 14, when the socialist parties, after pledging not to go to war with each other, voted for war credits to go to war with each other. Um, we've had problems on the left, you know, from the beginning. Um, and then the question of, okay, how do we deal with uh, two problems, I think, to talk about. One is what Michelle's called the iron law oligarchy within these mass parties, where tends to be the professional class, you know, managerial class takes the leadership positions and slowly, you know, takes the power away from the rank and file. We say that nonprofit organizations, trade unions, you know, our civil society organizations here. Um, well, the Greens originally had measures, actually Michelle suggested them, things like rotation. The four-year terms to the Bundestag, when they got in, they said, and they have alternates, they said the alternate would replace the person elected after two years. Uh, they said there would be an imperative mandate, concept from the Paris Commune, where the base of the party, the local chapter, would give instructions to their representatives in, in Bundestag or the state parliaments. Um, 
and the right to recall. Well, what happened? We were in there two years, and Petra Kelly, who was one of the, they called them promies, for prominent people, said, I'm too important to rotate. I'm not going to rotate. And, and they very quickly, uh, a political elite developed. And there was a struggle in the Green Party between what they called the fundies, although the for fundamentalists, although they called themselves the left, that was a pejorative on them, and the realities, the ones that said, who wanted coalition with the Social Democrats so they could get power. And in Germany, what they got was money, too. I mean, I, I don't know how it is today, but about 20 years ago, I looked at it, every damn uh, member of the Green Party is getting money, either as an elected official or as a bureaucrat paid for by the state who funds the parties to a certain extent. So it, that leads to de-radicalization, because like, I don't want to lose my job, so if something's controversial, we'll drop it from the program. So that process goes on, and I think the way you fight it is be, be, by being conscious of it. And setting up institutions like the Greens did originally in Germany, but sticking to them, like the rotation, like the imperative mandate, and so forth. Um, and then what happened to the Greens happened to every left liberal social democratic party in the world. The neoliberal you know, trend in the 80s and 90s you know, it happened to everybody, including self-styled socialist groups, including groups that call themselves communists and the Euro-communists, and including the communists in East Bloc, you know? They all became neoliberals. Assad in Syria became a neoliberal. They all did. So I, I guess I'm saying it's not inherent in the kind of politics the Greens are trying to put forward. One other observation is when you have access to power, there's a tendency to de-radicalize. The American Green Movement, I mean, we've elected you know, there are about 150 local elected officials, but we haven't gotten near federal power. So the Green Party in, in the United States has moved to the left. It's self-consciously eco-socialist. In the 90s and 80s, that, that wasn't possible. So that's just an observation. You know, power corrupts, I guess, and consciousness is really the defense against that. And then the last thing I'd like to say is socialist ideals matter. Socialist values matter. Democracy, free speech, independent trade unions, multi-party democracy. And this idea that real existing socialism, quote unquote, should be excused for mass repression, mass death from famine, uh, because it's socialism? I mean, under that rationale, you can justify anything. And as far as what the working class thinks, I mean, I'm thinking of my grandfather. He used to say, you know, you don't want to be like the Soviet Union because you can't pick your job. They tell you what your job is. Now, I don't know how true that was, but that's what I'm saying is working class people, it's like they want, they want freedom. They don't want to be told if that's socialism, they don't want any part of it. So I think to say real existing socialism, its crime should be excused, you end up discrediting the very idea of socialism. Socialist ideals and values matter. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what the question is. Are we just doing general responses? These are just and responses to what, yeah, what you thought of. Okay. Yeah, yeah no, I, I think everybody, um, or at least you and I agree on the necessity for um, uh, socialism with American characteristics. I think you would agree, but you're from Germany and we might be scared with socialism with German characteristics. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding, I'm kidding. stymies a lot of uh, German politics, especially around issues of, of Israel and uh, Palestine. Let's see. <laughs> I mean, like, we have to deal with, like, post-socialism. Like, Mike, Mike, please. Well, I, I didn't mean to sidebar it with my little jokes about uh, the Sonderweg, is that what they call it? Um, but no, like, um, I think that what's looming here, and I think what we're all addressing, and some of us have addressed in practice, uh, probably all of us have a, tried to address in practice is the overweening power of the, um, the popular front and the popular front mentality to completely subsume and uh, submerge uh, the possibilities that working class self-organization um, could actually produce. Um, you know, I, I credit uh, Platypus and I credit some people sitting here in this room and, and Chris Coutron and, and certainly other people and especially including William Clare Roberts with opening up an entire vista, I think, of uh, socialist thought that has been submerged in the question of the relationship between the state and civil society and the real abrogation of all of us on the left 
who have seen state action and administration uh, policies in order to uh, curb the power of capital and empower workers of a particular nation or, or a particular region as conflating that with, with socialism. And I think that now, as we struggle with this question of subjectivity, we struggle with this question of class consciousness, there is a way in which I think um, the, what William Clare Roberts would call the, the radical Owenite Republican background of, of Marx himself, that a revival of this sensibility could really cut orthogonally across divides of right and left, such as they exist in this country and its mass politics. Because um, the people that I work with, and I think many of the people that you know, some of, some of whom maybe even on like the Trumpist right, are extremely jealous of what they consider to be their rights and freedoms. And those things aren't, um, aren't a regressive thing. They're actually a positive thing. And we need to imbue that with um, a socialist content and a working class content uh, sufficient to show people that they're actually not that wrong about how fucked up society is and when that things need to be done to change it. It's just that, the, 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 that our politics has failed us because our ruling class has ultimately failed us. They don't even have a plan to get us out of the next three years as opposed to 10 years. So it's we ourselves, the working class, which has to have the plan in order to get humanity out of this mess. Great. Carlos? Thank you. Um, yeah, as far as protests, I, 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 I think protests are a good instrument. They have to be a part of any uh, socialist uh, politics. I just feel like it's often uh, treated in the American left as an end in itself. Uh, for many people, it, it serves as a sort of libidinal release that lets you, um, after you go out with a few buddies and hold up a few signs for a couple hours, feel like I did my job for the revolution. And um, I, I think that protests function more so as a, a political instrument for the left within the war of maneuver. And I think the central component of our battle is a war of positions, a war of ideas for a, a battle to win the hearts and minds of the American people. I don't think you do that through protest, um, or I don't think protest is the most efficient way to do that. It doesn't mean, of course, we don't protest. I'm in favor of, of protest. Um, I want to give an example because I, I think the class component here is extremely important. What are the sort of environments and, and, and forms of relationality that working people encounter when they go to most organizations on the left? Um, <laughs> uh, this is uh, my, my colleague from the Institute here, Kyle Pettis. Uh, today's his first day entering a university. Um, do, is this the sort of environment you're, you're used to? <laughs> uh, Not <laughs> one of our other directors at the Institute know he's a member of the Communist Party because uh, he believes in the cause and uh, you know he, he, he thinks the, the party could be uh, re reformed. Maybe he's a little crazy for thinking that. But uh, they always ask him because he's convinced all of his you know Trump libertarian co-workers about communism. They're all down for it. Um, and he's, he's very proud to, to speak about what he's been able to do. And the party club always asks him, why don't you bring them? And he can never answer honestly, because if he does, he's, he's going to end up being kind of mean, um, which is that the truth is that if he brings them, they're going to feel the same environment that they feel with their managers. It's going to feel like an HR meeting or like a diversity, equity and inclusion meeting. Um, and that's extremely off putting for regular blue collar working folk. That doesn't mean that they're not enlightened. That doesn't mean that they're bad people. It's just a different form of culture. And uh, what we've had in the US, I think, is this process of reproletarianization where you had this uh, section of the working masses in the 20th century, uh, because of various factors, um, you know, we had to improve the living conditions of working people because of, uh, you know, the communist alternative that was imminent, uh, the actual victories of the labor movement, and the fact that, you know, we're in the belly of the beast. There's imperialist uh, profits and crumbs that we can give to parts of the working class. You had a part of the working class become bourgeoisified. It became what we call the middle class. It, it had stability. It didn't have the precarity that is uh, archetypical of what it means to be a proletarian. It became bourgeoisified. And what we've seen over the, since the, the 70s plus that's being labeled by bourgeois political economists as uh, the death of the middle class has really been, as my colleague uh, explains it, a process of reproletarianization. 
But the problem is that all of these objective conditions that are uh, making the, the, the lives of these people worse and leading them to want to dissent, they're going into these organizations, but they still have the social consciousness of the middle class. And so there's this, there's this clash between the forms of relationality of regular working people that, I mean, you should go hang out with them. They love busting balls and within five seconds, they'd be canceled in any leftist organization in the country. Um, that's a problem. That's a serious cultural clash between the middle class that has this sort of new form of interest in, in, in socialist politics and that's dominating most of the socialist institutions in the US, if not all of them, and working people. And, uh, you know, call me dogmatic, but I still think that the revolutionary subject are the people that produce surplus value. The people upon whose labor, if they withdraw it from the economy, everything shuts down. So that's uh, just my two cents. Great. Thank you very much. We will. Oh, okay. So we'll go to questions now. Um, I'm trying to scan 25 people at once. So let's start with Richard. Let's keep two microphones up here so it'll be easier. Okay. We have three. Yes. Oh, so, we got three. We're good. We got that yeah. coming. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll, I can have one to pass around. Then. It's unfair that you're the one that has to be here. Oh, okay. So, well. <laughs> they have two up here. Oh, you have one. Okay. A lot of the background of this conversation seems to be about a question of historical memory. And a joke was made about, um, you know, socialism is German characteristic, but I wanted to ask the non-American on the panel a serious question about German history. Germany has a very rich socialist and left history as well as a very tragic one. So what I'm curious about is not the recent past in Germany, and I know there are a lot of German and Austrian people in this room. What, what lessons do you, law, do you draw from German history, say, since 1848? The history of the SPD, the history of the failure of 1848, the history of the failure of 1919, 1923, the Communist Party, the Nazi period, 1968. Is that history still relevant to you? Do you draw significant lessons from that? Or is that kind of water under the bridge that now you have to really just begin again? I mean, how does that affect your practice and thought about your politics today? That was a question for Carl. Yes. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Um, that's a big question, definitely. Um, so, maybe, first of all, my organization is we focus mainly on practice. We do, throw, we do draw on theory and we do reflect on history, but mainly when it comes to our practice. So, I think um, I can mainly draw actually from um, ex an experience of our recent um, practice, which is where we're trying to push socialization um, as a strategy for, um, for movements at the moment. And since I grew up in the east of Germany, and I know that's not really what, it's not in the 1970s or something like that, it's more it's focused on the GDR, but um, right now it's extremely hard to um, actually talk or like have socialist um, just expressions in our activism. It's really, really tough because a lot of people who were disappointed by the GDR are now voting for the right. And I think you can trace that even further back. So basically people are saying, hey, so do you remember what the socialists uh, did back in, um, in the early 1920s where they ended up voting for the Nazis? So people just kind of expect, like socialism has a very weak stance in Germany and like the popular you know, mindset in that way, even though it has a very rich history, just as you said. But um, what we kind of have to do, or what we kind of have to reflect on, is how to actually build up a positive image of it again. And I think it's, and that is really, really hard. And I'm actually really wondering about, uh, I was asking that myself about how you guys, as part of like communist parties, actually doing that because like American, like anti-communism was also pretty strong. So I'm wondering how to actually reframe that. And um, maybe let me think about it a bit further. Um, and what we do draw on, of course, is, or what my organization is very strongly drawing on, is on uh, revolutionary, real, 
um, a concept of Rosa Luxemburg. Um, it's called in German, it's called revolutionary uh, realpolitik. <laughs> What's the English expression for that? Really, it's the same thing. Okay, yeah, never mind. So basically, <laughs> um, so we do draw on that. Like I would say, we reflect on, um, or we draw on the um, theoretic knowledge from back then, but we don't really look at 1917 uh, and see, okay, what went wrong there and uh, what went right, and then we just kind of mirror our practice to that. So maybe. I, I actually wanted to extend that also to Howie and Carlos, because I know Howie, I've watched you lecture on 1848 before. I know also the German experience is very significant for the founding of the Third International. Um, so I was wondering if Howie or Carlos wanted to comment on that as well with maybe those moments to you. The question is, <laughs> the question is, uh, what can we get from German left history? Um, I'd, I'd read a lot of Marx. I think, you know, his uh, discussion leading up to 1848 about democratic uh, values and, and institutions and then, you know, his inclusion in 1848 that, uh, you know, workers need their own party because the middle class of business and professionals were unreliable allies. They're willing to sell the workers down the river to get some things, economic and political reforms for themselves. Um, Paris Commune, uh, he passed on, but passed on a legacy that, as I mentioned earlier, in you know, World War I, uh, the anti-militarist commitments were thrown away and uh, nationalism and imperialism infected many of the socialists. And the social movement, of course, split. And you had the, you know, people opposed to those who went to war, like Luxembourg and Lenin, trying to form alternatives. Um, I think one of the lessons that the Greens, you know, as I was describing earlier, tried to draw, because there was a whole debate in uh, Germany between reformism and revolutionary politics. You know, Edward Bernstein, you know, the, what was his slogan? The movement is everything, the goal is nothing, and we'll just keep incrementally winning reforms. And that's a, a weak analysis of the capitalist state uh, and democracy or bourgeois democracy under capitalism because of the power of the capitalists, even if you've got formal political rights. Um, so I think that's very important for us today. That, I mean, the German Greens, early Greens, were very conscious of what happened to the Social Democrats when they proposed those internal policies in their constitution for themselves. Um, and then, you know, you got the period when Hitler came to power and the communists are calling the socialists social fascists worse than the Nazis themselves and we're next. And, the, you know, social democrats saying we're going to support the lesser evil. Von Hindenburg uh, is the lesser evil to Hitler. And then Von Hindenburg appointed Hitler cha chancellor. So there's lessons there. Um, you want me to keep going? I'm sort of... <laughs> okay, I'm just doing this off the top of my head. Okay. Um, Rosa Luxemburg wrote in Reform and Revolution, No coarser insult, no baser defamation can be thrown against the workers than the remark, theoretical controversies are for the intellectuals. Lenin wrote, since there can be no talk of an independent ideology formulated by the working masses themselves in the process of their movement, the only choice is either bourgeois or socialist ideology. This does not mean, of course, that the workers have no part in creating such an ideology. They take part, however, not as workers, but as socialist theoreticians, as prudents, as vitamins. In other words, they take part only when they are able, and to the extent they are able, more or less, to acquire the knowledge of their age and develop that knowledge. So I wanted to read these two quotes and ask Sean and Carlos, it seems like they have an apparent agreement, but in fact I think they might disagree. Um, this nature of the pre-political civil society associations for the working class. Um, so the London Working Men's Association 
in the 19th century, and in the 19th century, the working men's parties in the United States had working men's libraries. They had lectures. They fought over the meaning of Owenism, of the cooperative movement. I think that there seems to be an agreement on the panel that something is necessary to create the preconditions for a mass party. I want us to get specific about what you all think those preconditions are. What does that look like? When we say civil society associations, what do we mean? What kind of new knowledge we need to be created in these conditions in order for a working class mass party to be successful? It seems like in Occupy, that didn't really take place, right? So I was in Sukhoti Park. We weren't teaching anything, right? We were having eight-hour meetings about the drum circle, right? Which is why the unions could come in and say, well, if you want to get serious about politics, you're going to follow us to Tomlin's Park, and we're going to have a real conversation about what's going to happen in the election. So we should fail better. So what do we want? Yes, sir. It's uh, it's tough to to go back uh, really really far in American history and claim that it's relevant. What's relevant from the 1870s and the 1880s? What's relevant from the 1890s? Um, if I if I were to answer your question about what a civil uh, social organization might look like and how it might act. I think we can go back to the real foundations of what an American uh, national labor movement looked like, which would have been the Knights of Labor, of course, and Terence Powderly. And the Knights of Labor was more than trade unions today, which are a service. You pay your dues and you get collective bargaining back. Maybe you get a picnic once a year. You know, you have the state arbitrating in between you and capital, the various uh, legislative means and judicial means uh, to do that. The Knights of Labor were a holistic organization, uh, and they were a civil social organization to the extent that they were directly confronting capital and directly organizing within their various communities where they were. What they did, failed at doing, but what they, what they did was create a holistic organization, everything from choral societies to workers' militias, uh, educational facilities, uh, all the way down to correspondence societies and newsletters and things of that sort. Any, any civil social organization that is going to be preconditional to the formation of a socialist party, an independent socialist party, is going to have to meet the all-encompassing needs of the class. Um, as, as they arise out of the contradictions of the wage relation, the contradictions of uh, the nation state, the contradictions of borders, uh, the contradictions of accumulation, uh, these these contradictions are constantly arising and we need to be meeting them on those levels. Um, when I say, when you say that civil society is dead, what does that mean? Well, part of it is, it means that the alienation and atomization is so rife in the society that it's hard to imagine how people could get along, uh, get together to have a, uh, a cookie, uh, a bake-off, let alone a party. And I think that Pre-political means that we need to take a step back and work on building sort of holistic organizations that can react to all of the various different on the ground, everyday ways in which our class is not only oppressed, but also the way that our class actually has incipient power within society. If the ruling class has abrogated, um, has abrogated any conception of having a plan, if capital is driving us closer and closer off the cliff, uh, if society itself has now devolved into like various message groups and like algorith algorithmically designed uh, ways to get you to spend money on porn or whatever it is, right? We need to posit the working class itself uh, and its own capacities and abilities as the solution to the problems of society at large. And I don't think, I think history shows that that can't begin by having the right intellectual ideas and bringing them down to the masses per se. I think it needs to begin by creating the various different organizations that will then compose themselves into a socialist party in a, on a grander scale. So stepping back a couple steps. Uh, thank you. Yeah, that's a, a great question. I think the, the first part, it, it kind of seems to imply uh, that, yes, we need to have this emphasis on working class people, 
but perhaps belittle, belittling uh, intellectuals is, uh, is something that if we look back at our tradition, people like Luxembourg and Lenin um, would have uh, urged against. I think it depends, because uh, you can look at uh, some of Marx's letters uh, around the time of the First International. He was worried that there was a lot of intellectuals coming in with their own uh, class background prejudices. And uh, the condition that he set for the inclusion of intellectuals is, can they uh, you know, sort of find a way to restructure their interests so that it aligns itself with the proletariat? So intellectuals themselves are, are, are not the problem. And even traditional intellectuals, people that participate in the academy, it's not the problem. But we do want to cultivate a, um, a, the sort of institutions that can systematically produce and pump out organic intellectuals. Um, we used to have a culture of working class readers here in the US. Um, this was something that I was talking with Abdul after the last uh, panel. You know, uh, I, I think the Modern Library or, or one of the other uh, uh, quite popular older editorials, they published the history of, uh, of, of some of the Western classics, what Lenin would call the, the treasures of, uh, of, of mankind for working people to read. And working people would go on weekends and, and, and have book clubs with their co They were in many ways more informed than like most graduate students in, in the humanities. And I have you know, some stories that I can tell from some of my professors. And that, that culture has kind of died out. And uh, the best minds in the working class have kind of just ended up going into the academy and, and being absorbed into the apparatuses of the academy. So we do need to figure out how to create the sorts of institutions that promote this form of organic intellectual um, I also wanted to, uh, to say that I, I think part of the problem of the intellectuals is that they, it's conjoined to the absence of a dialectical materialist worldview, but they, they think that they're the ones lecturing and teaching the working class. And in order for them to successfully lead and educate, they need to first learn. They need to understand what the working class is like, which is not an answer you could just copy paste in this country. We have so many regional differences. What some working people are like in the South is different from the Midwest, and it's different from the East and West Coast, et cetera. So you need to be ingrained with uh, working people. You need to understand the sort of life world that they operate in. Um, and on the basis of learning that, uh, finding the sort of common points that their spontaneous outlooks uh, have with Marxism, then you can begin to, to educate um, and uplift. But it's, it's, it's almost, uh, it's, it's a very, almost priest-like, relationship that, that parts of the intellectual left has, where it's like, I'm just going to lecture to you, and you're going to take it. And that if you don't accept it, you're the one that's at fault, not me. And uh, I think that's something that, that we have to overcome. And as far as civil society organization, they're essential. Um, it can't just be reading. That's going to be quite boring, for <laughs> especially in a society where there's not a lot of readers. We need to have bowling clubs and you know softball leagues and, and a whole host of other fun stuff that you know, the, the, that socialist organizers, communist organizers can do with working people so that their association of what a communist is isn't just a guy that's beating them over the head with a book, telling them what they ought to think and, and what they ought to be doing with their lives, but someone they can hang out with, have a few beers, bust some balls, and that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks everyone. Um, Occupy was just raised. And I just read that as we speak, there are a few hundred people actually gathering on Sakati Park, in Sakati Park in New York, um, which is interesting, I think. Um, and listening to your opening remarks and the discussion so far, I got the impression that the, the topic, the headline of the panel, could actually be from protest to protest. Um, so I, I, I think we have heard different uh, conceptions actually of you know where where protest needs to start what it actually contains I think I don't know Kava I'm not sure whether you would be in agreement with the other speakers that politics presupposes a mass political a, a mass party um, that's something I would I would like to raise or a question directed to you and the other question directed to all the panelists um, would be what is politics and I don't mean it in a, a completely general sense, but more concrete, what is politics under capitalism? Like, why do we need uh, civil social uh, uh, associations for? And another thing I would like to uh, ask everyone is, is there something like a Marxist politics? 
And what's the relationship between Marxism and politics? Okay, so just to kind of reiterate, so, because there was a special question for you, which is, so what is politics? Is there a specific Marxist politics? And then also for Kara, um, it was something about, can one beat their own uh, Yeah, yeah, the question was just, um, do you think that a mass party is a necessary prerequisition for, for politics? I think there's something that I'm actually missing in the translation here, and I've been thinking about it actually at the entire panel. Because when we talk about politics, or when like when you've talked about politics so far, I was sometimes thinking that it's meant especially by party politics. Also, like have I understood that correctly? Like but that's also why you called it from politics to protest and like uh, to protest and for me that's a huge difference because in Germany or like I don't know, in, like in my surroundings politics means like everything that you do um, oh my gosh that's a book um, to, <laughs> to transform society in a way so basically um, to be also to be part of like an organization that's not part of party politics and um, to me, the predisposition of the mass party is definitely, it doesn't, as I said, it doesn't need to be party politics at all. And I think right now, in like this society that is so alienated and that's so just spread apart by like neoliberalism, uh, post COVID, I think first we really need places where people can get together. And that can just be, as you said, edu educational institutions or tenants unions and just address people in their day-to-day -day life. And that's where I would disagree that a first subject would be the working class. I think it's just we're in a moment where you really just need to people where their interests are at because otherwise they're not going to listen to you. And um, so I think a concept that we've drawn on quite heavily, which came from uh, the US as well, is transformative organizing in communities so basically building up communities with the goal of always just implementing um you know like a higher goal or like a, the wish to move forward uh, or to um to actually activate people as political subjects and um i think a way this can be done is just also by just tiny reforms at first just like by organizing for just shortened work days, or also, um, I think maybe also just changing the way that reproductive labor is happening at the moment, because that is something that I also haven't heard you guys talk about, is like how women cannot participate in politics at the moment, or like much less still nowadays in like Western societies, because they are just part of this like nuclear family. And so by building up a community, through civil society organization, there's also a way that these care labor tasks can actually be spread out. And just to add, I know Andres also asked about, is there a Marxist politics? I know that was a general question, so I didn't know if you wanted to very quickly comment on that. I'm sorry? Is there a Marxist politics? I think I'm gonna have to think about that question. Okay. <laughs> That's fine. Sorry. <laughs> but does somebody else want to answer? I think it's for all of you guys. <laughs> well, there's a lot of questions that come up on what is politics under capitalism? Uh, I think we've had some discussions about that. A bourgeois capitalist state, uh, not all the power is up for election because it's in the economy and the capitalist class can decide to invest or not. They can go on strike with their investments, wreck the government that may be doing reforms they don't like and blame it on that government. So that's one of the limitations of bourgeois democracy. It's not the free speech or the independent press and those things which some people dismiss as bourgeois rights. I mean, Marx's history was fighting for those rights. So, uh, but under capitalism, you're dealing with a capitalist class that has a lot of power that's not up for election in, you know, in the government. Uh, so that's what well, limitation of politics. Um, I think, you know, as I just said, Marx's 
Marxist politics, you know, you got to be careful because Marx said, thank God I'm not a Marxist, when there were other people were saying they were following him, but um, he was definitely pro-democracy. That was central to his politics from, from everything I could see. Um, precondition for a mass party. Uh, well, we've got to build a, a culture in the movements where the rank and file is in charge. And we got a real problem now, which we haven't talked about this yet, is the nonprofit industrial complex and the professional managerial types that get control. And then we get federal programs like the supposed set-asides for disadvantaged communities in climate justice programs. And there's an elaborate grant process which the professional managerial folks know how to navigate and the people in the disadvantaged communities generally do not. So you have people from NGOs saying, we represent those communities, even if they don't live in them. Um, and so that's one example of how uh, it has depoliticized or disempowered uh, working people when so much of movement activity goes through these nonprofits. And there's conditions on what those staff can do. I can give you examples in New York where Members of the Green Party apply for jobs with groups like Citizen Action, Working Families Party, well not Working Families Party, Citizen Action's affiliate. And they were told, you can't be a member of the Green Party if you want this job. You gotta be a Democrat, Working Families would be okay, but you can't be a Green if you want this job. And that's a, you know, another way they exercise power. Um, in terms of the revolutionary subject of this, um, I don't think you should be dogmatically saying it's the industrial workers. Sometimes other sectors are ready to move for their own reasons. Women for reproductive freedom, black people for civil rights, uh, welfare mothers for better benefits. Uh, and they're not going there as industrial workers. On the environmental question, you know, working people care about the environment as much as everybody else, but they aren't going there saying we're the workers for the environment. They're saying we're environmentalists and they're workers, but they're saying, we're environmentalists and we want this, you know, environmental demand met. Um, so I think as organizers, we should go with the paths of least resistance, where the energy is. In the end, we do have to win over the proletariat, the industrial workers, as part of having a majoritarian movement for fundamental change. And the last point I'll make is there is an institution, it's the biggest institution on the broad progressive left, and that's the labor movement. It's reduced to 6% of the private sector and maybe 10% count in the public sector of workers, but it still has billions of dollars in income. And it gives away so much of that to the Democratic Party, which says, thank you very much, and then we'll forget about you until the next election. Look at what happened to the card check off with Obama, and now the PRO Act with Biden. You know, they, they say, we'll do it, but then they won't. Um, what if that movement, that money, by the labor movement was spent on a national daily newspaper by the labor movement, TV, TV station, broadcast network, radio and TV. I mean, that could have a big impact on the consciousness of, of people and bring at least a progressive perspective to you know, millions of people who otherwise wouldn't hear it. I think you know, that's an institution that many of us are part of through our local unions uh, or the unions we should organize. Oh, yeah. yeah, what is what is politics is a great question. Sometimes I feel like we don't even have politics in the United States. We have, of course, we're in one of these right now. We have a sort of stage manning, managed ruling class uh, spectacle. A lot of what passes for um, policy changes and regulatory changes happens behind the scenes with little or no input whatsoever. It seems like every once in a while we have politics. Uh, it seemed as though Obama from 2008 was like a, a political figure. As it turns out, he was kind of a placeholder for like the true political figure that came eight years later, which is Donald Trump. This kind of sea change that happened in American politics, as Reagan did before him, and um, of course uh, FDR before him. I think um, we, need, we need to be prepared now to think about politics differently and do politics because the rules of regulation of, the, of capital accumulation, um, the way that capital and the state interact, the way that the working class itself uh, were integrated into 
the system economically, but also politically, is changing very rapidly at this very moment. It was, you know, we're moving past the neoliberal period where politics felt as though it was in some sort of stasis. And what we're moving into, I don't think any of us are really sure. We have some intimations of what it is. It's got more economic nationalism, but it's still got like all sorts of like uh, subsidies for capital. And it, it's, it's a kind of a confusing mess. If we wanna, I think, act politically, um, we need to try to anticipate some of the changes that are happening and try to be like more Trumpian figures, I guess, than Obama type figures and start to like, the, to, um, to push our, our movements forward in such a way that cuts against the grain but opens up more possibilities. And that might be the vaguest answer anyone's ever given to a question, but that's what I got. What do you got, man? <laughs> um, I, I think it's a great question. I, I would say as far as what is politics, I'd say it's the form the class struggle takes in the sphere of the state. It's that simple. It's a re reflection of the class antagonisms at the basis of society, expressing themselves in uh, the, all things relating to the city, right? Um, as far as Marxist politics, I think it, it's, it's very clear. You get it at the beginning of the manifesto. What, what is a communist relationship to the working class supposed to be like? And there's two central things. One, they're not divorced from it. Uh, which is a, a part that's often forgot, but there's two components. The Marxists are the guys that are uh, capable of having this systematic understanding of, of not just the political arena, but the social arena, the ideological one, the economic arena. Uh, the ones that help working class people understand that the ills that they experience in their lives are not you know, uh, their fault as individuals, they're systematic ills, and that the, you know, it doesn't have to be like this. Uh, this is a system that is uh, man-made, a product of history, and it came and it will go, and they have the capacity uh, as a class to make it go. But the, the, the Marxists, uh, the, the communists, what they always bring to the center of attention in these working class struggles are two things. One, the international dimension. So the interconnection between labor politics and class struggles at home, and in our case in the belly of the beast, and, you know, the imperialist uh, hegemon, uh, the connection of those struggles with the struggles of working and oppressed peoples from around the world fighting back against imperialism. Um, I think we always have to take in those positions a sort of revolutionary defeatism, defeatism um, with relationship to the uh, enterprises of our states, uh, of our state abroad. And two, uh, the long-term uh, understanding of the battle. It's not enough if we win reforms. You know, we should try to get some good reforms to get the condition of working people in such a position where it's easier to fight. Um, but that's not enough. Like we, you know, those could be rolled back whenever because dictatorship, the ability to dictate and, and power is still in the hands of the capitalist class. So having the long-term view that it's social transformation and the international dimension, I think that's what the Marxist politics is really uh, rooted in. Can I just ask a quick follow-up to that? Because I noticed there you were quoting the manifesto and you were kind of um, substituting what, in the manifesto, they say communists, you were calling them Marxists there. So maybe just to follow up, is Marxist politics always communist, necessarily? <laughs> this might not be popular in this auditorium, <laughs> but uh, for me, yeah. yeah. I, uh, I, I think the communist tradition is the Marxist uh, tradition. Um, it's a tradition I embrace and wear it on my sleeve. I'm not ashamed of it. Um, I learn from it. I critique the parts that ought to be critiqued. But I, I consider it my tradition and, uh, you know, I, uh, I, I look at it for insights into the future, but I'm, I'm not dogmatic. I think uh, the most important part about the Marxist worldview in comparison to all the other previous philosophical worldviews, is the fact that it's open and creative because it recognizes that its object of study is itself in constant process. It's a basic ontology of, uh, of dialectical materialism. Um, it's an ontology of becoming, not necessarily of static being. And, Therefore, um, it, its worldview has to be open. Capital can't be finished. It can't be a finished product. Uh, you know, he couldn't even finish the first volume. That's what he was working on at the end of his life. Uh, he couldn't finish it precisely because the object of study is still developing. It's a, it's a social totality of movement. So uh, it means that we draw from our history, but we always have to be creative and, and re-examine and see whether the, you know, the things of the past um, ought to be kept or rethought. That doesn't mean that 
if they have to be rethought that they were false in the past, uh, but that conditions have changed then. You know, if there was a, a need for a new, uh, a, a, a new type of party uh, that, um, you know, that ended up being developed and, and successfully conquered power, maybe today there's a different strategy that, that should be needed. Um, let's test it out, let's see what works. Uh, yeah. uh, all right. I want to ask, I feel like something that's been discussed here about politics and protests kind of almost dodges an aspect for me, like, so earlier it was mentioned, like, the proletariat is the revolutionary subject, and I think it's important to note that, like, the proletariat, like, the classical revolutionary subject is not just because, like, they were inherently more radical, but also because they held power through controlling production, that they had the ability to flex that power against the capitalist system and to use that to extract change or even to weaken it for revolution and destruction. So following up on that, like how can we, how can we talk about politics and protests without talking about what it means to actually like gain working class power and hold it and make it meaningful? And how, how can I take a political movement, party, or figure seriously if they are unable to go among the working class and talk to them about politics and ask them to seriously interrogate their own beliefs in terms of like what it means to be a communist and what it means to have solidarity with other people, not just domestically, but internationally. So, I feel like Sean, you would have... The revolutionary subject in production. Yeah, and, and what would it mean? You know, how, can you just repeat the last two things quickly? We're just trying to summarize. Mm -hmm. More so just like, I personally have been able to like go and talk to a wide variety of people in different workplaces and schools about communism and get them to like seriously think and interrogate their own ideas about what it means to be a human being, what it means to be a communist, and what it means to hold political power. And to that end, I want to ask almost like, so what is it about this audience that merits like coming to this audience with the question of like, uh, of like rejecting purity politics and talking about like uh, making the working class like the forefront of the movement. Like is this audience like the working class first off? And second off, like, I don't know, just what does it say generally about our movements that like nobody up here seems to be able to really like actually get into workplaces and talk with people seriously about like a vision for a socialist future and like what does it mean to move forward from this so general reflection on the situation general reflection on the situation. yeah i mean uh i think that all of us who work uh have had good conversations in the workplace on uh not just individual issues that might come up that could be kind of turned in a direction that make them understandable from a communist perspective but also larger analysis of the world and the reasons why the particular person you might be talking with feels put upon uh, and feels powerless. I think one major impediment we have, of course, is uh, moving, that, in a, uh, moving that conversation in a direction of convincing the person that what's happening in this realm of ideals, ideas and even these things that they themselves might believe um, could be uh, productive of a politics that could actually change the world. Um, because that, I think, is one of the main impediments, and it's not just for, for communists, but I think for people um, who push uh, capitalist politics too these days, right, is the biggest problem is convincing people that anything could ever change, except for the worst, and except for in a sort of naturalistic sort of way as the economy manages to buffet people left and right, the global economy, and as uh, politicians continue to sell everybody down the river. I think that like the problem is greater than simply how do we make people believe in communism. It's like how do we make people 
not only um, believe that politics is possible, but also that they themselves can be part of a movement and powerful within a movement, uh, strong enough to actually uh, make a difference in the world. And I think that that is the product of decades and decades and maybe centuries of um, people feeling more and more like um, there's a, uh, that they themselves are not the product, or, or they themselves are incapable of doing anything about their lives. So I feel like um, maybe as like a pre-political thing too, people need to start feeling that they have a capacity to actually make uh, discerning decisions about how they feel about the world based on their experiences, but also that working collectively with other people, they actually can change things. Something even as simple as the Clamshell Alliance, you know, which I've heard of, and the efforts that you've been making in Germany. You know, these I think are valuable experiences for people to imagine a world where they actually have, could make a difference. Do you want to answer that? Does anybody else want to? Yeah. Which is kind of short, but it's not awesome, right? You go first, I'll go second. Yeah. Okay. Here, you can have this one. Um, hello. Um, I think oh, what I've experienced, at least firsthand, in, um, in Germany is that a lot of the problems also come from what we also already talked about is that there's just a failure or people have unlearned how to hold uh, conversations in that way. So people read a lot of Marxist theory and they're really, really deep into, I don't know, they might have uh, the deepest analysis of the 18th Brumaire or something, but they actually can't talk to normal people anymore. <laughs> really. And I think that's a really big problem. And um, sometimes I feel like there's a disconnect between the more like Marxist or I would say rather like communist movements and um, the more like what you guys call like street politics and I do feel like there needs actually to be a conversation again because the street politics people often can talk to the people and meet them where they're at but they might not really have the means or the analysis to actually push it forward so I do think that to just Relearning on how to ask questions and actually making people reflect on themselves is actually a very useful tool. And um, I work in like um, I work in education, um, in like like just edu in an educational organization. And what we've been really noticing is that um, I think maybe you can re relate to it a bit. It's like that there's missing leftist populism like because the, like Marxist analysis is so deep and like you have to really as you said um, uh, Carlos said like really have to have like an international understanding of things and how the world works that's really really hard to convey it in very short words whereas like right wing populism is, works so much easier and I do feel like there's a need for us to actually get back into like media as well and actually find short leftist answers that then actually get people thinking and ask for more. Um, yeah, I, I don't know what the problem is talking to people who work. I mean, I've done it for, did it for over 50 years, you know, between construction sites and, and warehouses working as a teamster. Um, but I was now in conversations about, you know, the 14th, what's the blue mayor, 14th blue mayor of 18, whatever it was. I can never say that title. Or the Communist Manifesto or anything. I mean, we had more practical concerns. Some of them, I mean, there was, there was one guy I'm thinking of who I could never get to register to vote because he was so cynical about the whole system. And, uh, but every time something was in the news, he wanted to know what I thought. Because he knew I was political, I've you know, been a Green Party candidate, and uh, he wanted my opinion. So, uh, you know, there's a, there's a political life there. It's, it's just uh, they don't, working people just don't have as much, they don't have the megaphones that some of the, you know, more uh, privileged people do. Um, as far as the proletariat goes, my understanding of Marx and Engels was, and Engels put this in particular in one document, that the factory process would discipline and unite those industrial workers and cooperative labor. But I think the labor process has moved on, and the, you know that industrial working class, smaller part of the working class, 
Other sectors are still exploited. Explaining exploitation is not that hard. I've done that with you know, many people. Um, and I think we can do that kind of thing. Uh, and then there are sectors, you know, I don't know about the industrial proletariat as a whole, but the logistics sector, you know, which the Teamsters organized primarily and others, uh, you know, UPS and a few other companies, we could really stop the whole economy. Just, you know, one or a few unions. Uh, not that they, th th those workers want to do that or their leadership wants to do that, but that potential is there. Um, and then as far as challenging workers, it's not been on ideology. I, I remember uh, James Boggs, who some of you may know of. He, he was a uh, protege of CLR James. He was kind of the senior advisor of the League of Revolutionary Black Workers in Detroit when that was going on in the late 60s. And you know, now going into the 80s, and he, he was involved in the Green Movement at that time. He used to say, we got to challenge workers, and he was doing this in Detroit, on hot goods, stolen goods. He, he said, you know, people get it because they, you know, buy that stuff because it's cheaper, but in the long run, you're, you're giving support for the criminal economy that's, you know, ripping you off. And he, he said, we got to challenge them on that. And of course, you know, I think, you know, when bigotry comes up, you got to challenge that. So those are the kind of things I think practically we can challenge. Um, unless you've got, you know, the union brother or sister in a study group, you know, the Communist Manifesto or the 18th Room Mayor is not going to be, you know, what you're probably talking about at the lunch break. <laughs> okay, um, thank you, everybody. So there have been a couple of, I guess, terms and categories that have been used somewhat like interchangeably, but I also feel like we're taking them for granted. So for instance, I've heard now many times you all talk about the masses and the working class, um, as well as the movement, the party, and the organization. Um, it's unclear what the relationship is between these things or what they really mean. Um, and there were three examples, actually, that Howie brought up that I thought we might want to revisit because maybe it could help to make sense of some of this. Um, so he talked about the Iron Law of Oligarchy by Robert Michels um, and the idea that, you know, in, I guess Howie, you said that a PMC within the um, party kind of becomes um, an end in itself. I mean, for Michelle's, it's not just that there's like an elite in the party that takes all the power. The kind of flip side to that, um, which I think relates to other things you brought up, Howie, is um, that the party becomes an end in itself. The, or the form of organization um, becomes an end in itself, and so it becomes a sort of vested interest. Um, and that's you know where this oligarchy kind of finds its basis in. Um, you also brought up, related to this, uh, the Edward Bernstein idea that the, the revisionist idea that the movement is everything and the goal is nothing, which kind of reflects this. Um, and you brought up the SPD's vote for war credits in 1914, um, which of course was done in part, or at least the people who voted for war credits claim, that the working class actually supported the war and that if they had voted against it, they would have lost the support of the working class. So what this brings up for me is that um, uh, perhaps one can't take the working class for granted. And in fact, they might be divided politically. Um, and I think this was brought up too in the discussion of communism and socialism, right? The idea of a communist party, at least uh, in the communist international, was that it was supposed to actually take up or represent this political split um, in the working class. Um, so my question is, can we take the working class for granted? Are they simply the same um, as the masses? And what is the relationship of the movement, um, the party, and different forms of organization? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. That's a, that's a really good question. I, I think bef before I attempt to answer it, um, what, one of the things that we always focus on emphasizing at the Institute is, you know, for people to avoid definition mongering. The idea that uh, you can understand these complex uh, phenomena, these concrete realities, that means that they contain a unity of many different things um, through just simple definitions. That that's, definition is in many ways an abstraction away from the world and it doesn't let you really capture uh, the development of the things that it is trying to explain. But it's, it's so heavily embedded in how people do politics and just think about like the debate bros and the, the conservative or liberal ones is like, what's the definition of this? What's the, and it's, it's this weird, almost uh, 
uh, conceptual game that is divorced from the actual things that they're talking about. So um, I think uh, approaching the question of like working class or masses, right, it, it re requires situating it in the relation. Just, yeah, in the it re also, yeah. Sorry. Requires situating it in the in the relations in which it exists and uh, and how it unfolds and, and takes different forms. For me, and, and, and this is how I interpret the Marxist tradition approaching it, the working class, the proletariat, is the section of the toiling masses that produces surplus value. It is the basis of all the whole capitalist economy. There's the industrial proletariat, but there's other parts of you know, the, uh, the, the working class that are not necessarily industrial, that also produce surplus value, that participate in productive labor. And uh, I, I would call that the working class. Now, this other term that has uh, traditionally uh, been, been employed by the communist tradition is either toiling masses or working class. And that uses a more general definition um, that some people confuse because you find it within Marx to describe the working class in various parts of the specifically early Marx, but which is when you have nothing to sell but your labor power. You know, so it, when you have nothing to sell but your labor power, which is a vast majority of our society, they're part of the, the toiling masses. Um, that's also a condition of proletarianism. But what distinguishes the proletariat is that the relationship that they have to production itself is one where they're the ones that are producing the surplus value. There's other workers that are part of the toiling masses that they don't have anything else to lose but their labor power, sell their labor power as a commodity, but they exist in other spheres of uh, the, the cycles of, of capital. There's some that Marx called like the, the you know, service work, for instance, he called them agents of circulation. And he was very explicit, you know, part of their wages or, or salaries are rooted in the exploitation of uh, the productive laborers, the industrial proletariat. Doesn't mean he condemned them or, or called them parasites or anything. He's in many ways saw that there was a, a, a united sort of interest there. Um, but that's how I would uh, dis distinguish uh, uh, those two things. I think there is one more thing, um, which was also the party in relationship to those, because you had the masses and then you had the class, and I think also the relationship of the party to that. So is the party representing all of them? Is it representing part? I, I think the, the party is rooting itself in the industrial proletariat precisely because the traditional Marxist approach has been that it is that class that, um, because of the brunts that it bears from the system, because it is the, the heart of the system with, with you know, as Howie mentioned, if, if some of the people in these industries stop working, it shuts everything down. Um, if the workers, you know, no offense, but if workers in Starbucks stop working, people just go to Dunkin' Donuts, um, as I did, you know, to, to be consistent with the BDS uh, strike. But um, so it's, uh, that's, that should be the foundation, I think, of a communist party, but it should also be able to incorporate these other classes that also find themselves in an antagonistic relationship to capital. Um, and it, it should be able to organize that, having the foundation, the industrial proletariat. Now, in a different context, say you're in China, um, it takes a creative act of, of Marxism to realize maybe the peasant could be the, the foundational principal class in the struggle and the proletariat can tag along for a little bit until that peasant is proletarianized through the socialist process and it becomes itself the, um, the principal class in the socialist struggle. Uh, but I, I think that our conditions in the US are much more archetypical of the ones that Marx was describing in Britain than those that our comrades in the Global South and East had to deal with that forced them to perhaps uh, take some creative leaps from the traditional uh, Marxist analysis. Um, well, you asked what we meant by some of these things. I mean, when I say masses, I mean lots of people. Um, yeah, I think you're right. Michelle's talked about the party becoming a vested interest. I've, you know, read analyses where you know, the party voted for the war credits because they were afraid of losing all the property they had accumulated, you know, with the membership dues and printing presses and publications and gymnasiums and, you know, just trade union buildings. They, they were afraid that if they challenged the German state, the German state would take their property. So it did become a vested interest. Um, and of course, you're right. I mean, nationalism affected the workers as well as, you know, the other classes in Germany. So um, that is a problem when you get a party, you know, that's uh, 
something you've got to be conscious of being potentially a problem. Um, and I think if we do, it's come up with classes, working class is not uh, going to be unified around every question and have the right position. So that's always a struggle. And uh, so we shouldn't take it for granted. And I wrote another note down, but I just got to F, and then it was time to speak. So I, <laughs> I, just, I can't remember that point. <laughs> Oh no. Oh. Hello. Um, I saw like two themes in most people's opening remarks that seem to be from the last 10 or 20 years. People failed to learn and they ended up repeating uh, the same mistakes that have been made in the past. Um, the other thing was everyone seemed to agree that we need a mass party, um, which, or a socialist party or communist party. Uh, not right now, because we, apparently we're in a pre-political, we're in a pre-political moment. But uh, everyone claimed this is necessity. But a lot of the tactics and strategies the millennials inherited come from the new left, who took them up specifically because the mass parties of the 20th century seem to fail. So why is it we need a mass party if that was actually something that the new left thought they learned a lesson from, that it didn't work? Well, that, that's been one of my themes this weekend, is that it's the wrong lesson the new left took from the problems they had with the old left. They went from uh, what was wrong with the old parties to no party. And beyond that, no organization, that movements in the streets were sufficient to win reforms that people wanted, like civil rights and the end of the war in Vietnam. So. The question is, what was wrong with the old parties? And, you know, that's the discussion we should have been having all these years, all these decades. Um, I think structures like the German Greens try to deal with compared to the old Social Democrats. I think the legacy of Stalinism um, is another one that has to be dealt with if you want to have a, a socialist party that is uh, something the American people can get behind. Um, and there are just a lot of questions that should have been debated, you know, the organizing, the, the question of is now the time to build a mass party or should we wait till the preconditions are met? I mean, I've been being told since, you know, 1968 when Peace and Freedom came up, now's not the time. The objective conditions will throw them up. You know, well, man, I mean, I'm getting up there in my 70s. I don't want to wait. <laughs> I think, and what I found from the Green Party compared to some other efforts, is that by actually doing it, running candidates, we can build bases in local communities. It's just most of the left hasn't been doing that, hasn't joined us in doing that or formed their own parties and we could get together. We have been open to that. You, that's why you've got a Green Rainbow Party in Massachusetts and a D.C. Statehood Green Party in Washington, D.C. So um, I think that question is you don't wait. You start organizing. I mean, it just the system and you know the dialectics, the gods, whatever, are just not going to hand it to us. We gotta, we gotta work at it. Yeah, sure. If you guys um, when you were just referring to what was uh, wrong with the old parties, basically, I was basically thinking about how in uh, the revolutions of like the 1970s, the the ideal person that you had to be was like this male Bolshevist. Or like you had to be like this one. So also like the women in the party had to become like, had to like adhere to a certain standard. So what I felt like the new left was necessary for was to also like split up and also like fight for the emancipation of like different subjects and like focus on different struggles and like have that awareness in that sense because the old parties never really did that. It was like a unified person that you had to become and now it, I feel like it has changed. So going back from that, I do feel like we have moved forward or we've gained, um, yeah, we've, we've gained much more knowledge on how to deal with like 
also like discrimination in our party like internally that we can now make move against and have like an emancipa emancipatory struggle for all and not just for some. Oh, actually, so Carlos, go ahead. Do you? No, no. I'm, I'm doing a graph thing. I, I think that's a very uh, interest. I, I think it's a very interesting uh, uh, question. I, I, I do, to a certain extent, agree that the new left, in its critique of, of the old left, critiqued the wrong thing, um, and ended up taking with it, uh, you know, some of and abandoning some things that are central. For me, the, the, the central flaws of the old communist left, the com, you know, embodied in the Communist Party here in the U.S., um, is not necessarily its inability to fight for various other struggles. They were at the front line of the struggle for black freedom and the black freedom movement. Um, from very early on, I, I think I've seen statistics that it was the most diverse non-black organization in the country. Uh, they were also at the forefront of other forms of nationalities struggles. Um, the question of national liberation was always central uh, to uh, the Marxist-Leninist tradition, as well as the woman question. Um, the woman's question was, was foundational. So um, there are problems with, uh, if we consider like other pre-communist traditions and, and socialist organizations, uh, those did have some problems, quite a bit of problems there. I don't think the communists did. But I think the central problem was dogmatism. Uh, the central problem was, was dogmatism. The, the communist parties from around the world, a lot of them, and I hate to admit this because this is my tradition, but uh, they were just basically taking cues from Moscow. And that's wrong. <laughs> that's uh, not even what Moscow did in order to succeed. They had to creatively understand their uh, situation, their people, and advance struggles on, the, on that basis. The Chinese were able to succeed because they broke from uh, having to just follow the line of, of Moscow. So um, I think if we look at our Communist Party, it was whatever the Soviet Union said, we just did. Um, if one guy was good one day, we cheered it on. If one guy was bad another day, we condemned them. And it was just following whatever Moscow uh, said. And it's a very serious problem of dogmatism that I, I think we, we still have today. And that sucks the living spirit of Marxism, which is fundamentally creative. So. So we have 13 more minutes. I do have a list in my head of next questions. So go, but we're probably going to close it. Is this more? Thing? Um, yeah, I have two questions. And one, it seems like, you know, from the opening remarks, there might be a conflation of the urgency of austerity and degraded social conditions, p poverty, which, you know, and, and perhaps the climate crisis, right? And maybe, maybe that urgency isn't true or won't always be true, or even if it is true, is in conflict with other things that are being said on the panel, which have to do with a long-term project that can't be governed by immediate, urgent concerns, that really has to take a, a different kind of time horizon. Um, and I'm wondering if also that question of austerity urgency isn't being conflated with the different question of atomization and a sense of historical helplessness. Because that to me does not have simply to do, socialism does not have simply to do with the experience of poverty and exploitation. It has often emerged in periods of prosperity and economic growth. That was true in the Second International. That was true of the New Left, right? The, the New Left grew in a period of great, of, of great prosperity, world historic prosperity. And of course we live, we can't forget, we live in an era of world historic prosperity today in terms of hundreds of millions of people being lifted out of poverty around the world. 
and that I think shouldn't be discounted, or treat it as neoliberal propaganda. I don't think we should hinge our politics on claims that things are getting worse, right? It, it isn't simply about that. Uh, it's rather a question of how the present is an obstacle to the potential of our society. The other thing that I wanted to raise, and it's the second question, is, is the problem with intellectuals that they sound like the HR department? Or is the problem with intellectuals that they're not really good intellectuals? Right? To me, I don't think that, the, that intellectuals need to go and play softball with the working class. I don't think that that's like helps me to understand anything, right? A real intellectual, the real intellectuals that our tradition has generated are of world historic status. They address the entirety of the intellectual life of their times. They were consumed with addressing the John Stuart Mills and the Herbert Spencers and all of the other, you know, the, the Gerg Zimmels and the Max Webers and the Rob, Robert Michels of their day, right? That's the task of an intellectual, right? It's not to dress like the working class, not to cut their hair like the working class, not to talk like the working class, right? So it seems to me that this issue of the degradation of civil society has to be linked not to, you know, we, we have to reflect more seriously, in other words, of the depth of the crisis of socialism understood as a merger of a working class movement with socialist intellectuals, right? And the deep crisis at that level, right? So I, I, I guess I would, I would say that when we talk about something like the death of civil society, or the degradation of society. We're part and parcel of that is the fact that the University of Chicago ain't what it used to be. Right? The New York Review of Books ain't what it used to be. Like the whole of intellectual life, even within living memory, never, never mind like the intellectual life of, you know, of Rosa Luxemburg and Lenin and Weber and Durkheim and all the great the Findus Eckla intellectuals that we just read here and don't even understand anymore, right? I guess I'm asking about you, know, what, how can we think about this as, a, in a sense, a multifaceted project? Uh, one that doesn't immediately, I, I, to me, like what you're saying about intellectuals, it, you know, it can, and I, I think that maybe Sean was, most agnostic about this, and I appreciated it, which is really, I was wondering, Sean, when you were talking about like really stepping back and building up civil society and strengthening the working class institutionally and so forth, um, I love those comments, very sympathetic to those comments, and I really thought to myself, what use is socialism for that, right? Like, as a real question, not as, a, as any kind of, you know, uh, bait, but, you know, how does that relate to, you know, if we're going to build a party, right, should it be a labor party that addresses the issues of working people? Or what would it mean to say this party is socialist? Not green, not labor, not this, not that, but it takes up this old, tattered flag of history. Sean, I think, yeah. Oh, I can go either way with it. Uh, those are great and challenging questions and comments. Um, I think that uh, it's easy for those of us who may have been Teamsters and are now retired, people who are currently in the district council, people who have experience working, um, I think it's common to try to make some distinction between ourselves uh, and intellectuals because uh, within the division of labor, intellectual has become somebody who's at the University of Chicago, for example, right? What the sense that I get and, and what both of the projects that I've, I've been tinkering around with over the last couple of few years or so, the, the, the presupposition is that 
there are organic intellectuals, as there are organic militant into intellectuals that exist out in society, but who are isolated, ultimately. I think your, your comment that this is just as much a crisis of, um, of the intellect as it is of the will, I think is very well taken. In the beginning of the Independent Labor Club of New York, as, as we understand it, um, it is trying to reach out and to find, through the various means that we have, those organic intellectuals that might um, form the nucleus of something larger. So if you will, like a merger of really existing organic intellectuals with a broader class stratum that might um, be interested, not in a purely materialistic or economistic way, not, not the most abject, not the most put upon, not the most exploited and oppressed per se, although they could be that. Perhaps the, those elements of the working class who, who, um, who understood the great promise that life in the United States and capitalism might have provided to them in another situation, but as they've been re-proletarianized, as they've been shunted out of the true intellectual uh, pursuits that the academy or the media might provide them, uh, have now ended up falling into the rest of the class, but still retain some sense that their future and the future of the people that they know can be greater, the potential is greater than the lot that they've been given. So I think that, and this is why maybe I didn't answer the question about masses and movements, which was a very good definitional question, and I think something that, they're, that I have certainly been doing some slippage on, is because I feel as though when we're pre-political, we even need to step back to and think about gathering our forces, but more importantly, gathering our powers and showing through demonstration effects and throwing, uh, showing through social and civil means that socialism isn't attempting to get enough reforms that you either tip over or like somebody can press the socialism button, that instead it's like, it's our growing capacity to rebuild and recreate a world, or to rebuild and to build and create a world that already exists out there in, in, in essence through our own socialization and through our own central importance to the production and social reproduction of society. And that this isn't a state project per se, but this is instead us taking seriously our duty, uh, our, our historical duty, our personal and our collective duty to um, overcome capital through building our own capacities, if, if that makes sense. So yeah, organic intellectuals, right? I, I think that these people, I know that they exist because they're out there, right? We, we see them at work all the time. The guy who was constantly asking you how your questions about various different political issues and took that stuff seriously was obviously the type of person who, given different circumstances, could have been self-empowered to take political action but wasn't. And I think that uh, these people are probably even more important than the faculty of the University of Chicago for the struggle of socialism, <laughs> if possible. <laughs> I, I think that's a, a great question. I participated in the panel uh, some months ago that was called uh, The Intellectuals and Their Divorce from the Working Class. And I had my, my good buddy who, who works in rail email me afterwards offended about the title because he, he felt that him and, and his coworkers are intellectuals as well. Um, and uh, he suggested changing it to academics and, uh, and the working class. but. Um, I agree, There's, uh, it, it isn't always the case that things getting worse lead to more revolutionary activity. I think uh, Lenin lists that uh, amongst one of the, the preconditions of understanding an objectively revolutionary situation. But sometimes it's, it's, the class struggle is more like a Rocky movie, where like, it's after you get a couple hits in that you can start beating Clubber Lang's butt or, or whoever else, uh, Draco. Um, so it, it, it uh, but that's an assumption that comes, it, it comes from bourgeois political economy. Uh, it's uh, John Locke who uh, holds that uh, revolution comes when there's a series of oppressions that accumulate on, uh, uh, on a people that force them um, to not be able to go on in the old way and have a revolution. Um, as far as the intellectuals, I'm definitely not, uh, you know, urging intellectuals to, to cosplay as working class people, to throw away the suits and, and button up shirts and just start wearing flannels. Um, it's <laughs> I'm sitting right here. <laughs> <laughs> I wear flannels most of the time. 
not going against my own advice. You look sharp, though. <laughs> he, uh, he, he said I, he wouldn't bring me here if I didn't wear a suit. So <laughs> thank him. Um, so that, that's not what I'm talking about. And when I use the PMC, at the, the in, intellectuals are a part of that. But the PMC in general is not just intellectuals. I think intellectuals do have a role to, uh, you know, as Gramsci said, defeat bourgeois ideology in its most coherent form. Take up the bourgeois ideologues and beat them. So that when those ideas trickle down uh, in, into the masses, you've already beat them at their highest level of coherence. It becomes very easy to beat them when they reappear in, in political streamers or something like that. People that become very influential for uh, working people that aren't on their phone for, for long periods of time. As far as there was a comment also that you made about the new left that I have a note here, but I can't remember what your comment was. Do you uh, remember? You said something about the new left and its growth. I simply said that the new left grew in the era of prosperity. prosperity. That's right. Prosperity, yeah. I think, and, and this might... Uh, but that wasn't the only period in the history yeah, of socialism. This, when this the might get me uh, in, in a position where I might not be able to leave this auditorium safely. <laughs> but we, we have to <laughs> send it, right, as the kids say. Um, if we look at the political economy of knowledge behind the new left, we cannot deny, and there's vast evidence for it. There is a lot of State Department money behind propping up the new left, explicitly as a what the CIA agent Thomas Braden called a compatible left, a left that opposes communism, but that criticizes capitalism and a lot of times in a very culturalist way, divorced from any analysis of political economy. So the new left booms, but behind that boom, perhaps some of it is organic and, and spontaneous and real, but we can't forget the billions of dollars that we're given uh, in, in propping up journals, propping up institutes, propping up the material foundation in which the new left ideas were uh, concretized, were actualized. So I, I think perhaps that growth that it has in a period of growth is not as organic as, as the previous, the other example you provided. Can we are now? Interesting you mentioned Tom Brady. He was a trustee at Dartmouth College when I was there uh, before my draft when came up in the Marine Corps. Right? Sideshow. Um, and, you know, we used to protest him because there was an article he wrote for the Saturday Evening Post called, I'm glad the CIA is immoral. And one guy who went to Dartmouth a year after me then went to Princeton graduate school and found up in the attic of the Wilson School papers from Tom Braden between him and his CIA colleagues as to which secrets should they reveal in the I'm glad the CIA is a moral article and which should they keep hidden. Uh, and what they revealed was mainly intervention in uh, you know European politics preventing the Communist Party in Italy from gaining power or trying to and so forth. Um, but I think it's a big stretch to say that this guy was influencing a new leftist like me. I was protesting his sorry ass. And, you know, I don't think Port Huron's statement was written under orders of the CIA. So I think, you know, you can't just dismiss the whole movement because, of course, the ruling classes and the intelligence services of not just the U.S., but many powerful countries try to influence social movements. Can I, can I ask, before you go to the next point, did I say that it was Thomas Braden who funded this? Did anyone hear me say that? You said the State Department. I said the State Department funded it, and I referenced Thomas Braden because he's the one that develops the term to categorize what it is that the State Department is funding, and he calls it a compatible left. That means a left that the ruling class is perfectly fine with. That's why it's compatible. It's not a scary left for the ruling class. If they're giving billions of dollars to it, they're not very scared of it. Well, I don't know what billions of dollars went into the new left, but let's let's no, leave it there. I mean, why don't you just condemn public schools because they're trying to create a patriotic citizen? Because because public schools aren't saying we're the, we're having a revolution. We're Marxists. We're trying to overthrow the system. You know, it's and, and I'm not saying we could just condemn outright the new left. I, you know, I think a lot of these thinkers are valuable, and I don't think that they're writing books for the sake of the CIA. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying they're doing the scholarship that they're doing, but as you know, the dancers and, and theater performers, they are giving us, they're given a stage and a, a very important one 
through the financial um, uh, support that the State Department's put behind it. And all of this is extremely well documented. I recommend uh, anyone who hasn't already to check out the, uh, the, the book, uh, The Cultural Cold War by Francis Stoner Saunders, and to check out the recent work of our colleague Gabriel Rockhill, who uh, shows how that this has propped up the Frankfurt School, how it's propped up French theory, Foucault, postmodernists, and a whole host of other people who in the academy are considered the most radical of radicals. Uh, but there's a reason why you can talk about them in the academy, but not about Lenin, not about Mao, not about literally any revolution that actually succeeded in uplifting the lives of working people. Well, my one comment on that is conspiracism is a big problem on the left. <laughs> Instead of a class analysis, we get cobbles of, you know, people manipulating us behind the scenes, but I'll leave it there. Um, I do agree with the comment that uh, the left often rises in times of prosperity. It's a phenomenon of rising expectations. You know, we start making gains and, and then we begin saying, well, what's a really good life like and what we deserve? I think that's, you know, as was pointed out, has happened repeatedly, uh, you know, in the last 150 years or so of capitalism. Um, and then on the question of intellectuals, or you know what Marx and Engels call the intelligentsia, um, you know what they should aspire to be is a revolutionary intelligentsia, working with oppressed and exploited people, and the goal is basically to dissolve those class differences. A class soci classless society is what socialism is about. And I know I've read in Marx uh, and Engels that. You know, one purpose of the workers' movement, the socialist movement, is to bring workers up to the highest educational level so they are fit to self-govern society. And that, you know, is a role for the intelligentsia or the people that are educated to share their knowledge. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, so in, I have a question, and I want an honest answer as possible from you guys. Be, it's been full uh, So my question is, where is the American left going in the next 10 to 20 years? Right now, it seems that the DSA is losing a lot of its members from the Bernie boom. Bernie's not going to come back. The millennials in the DSA are retreating to private life and starting families. They're not out there canvassing anymore. It's being taken over by a bunch of entryists and there's infighting in the DSA. It's gonna crack up imminently. There's the rise of various uh, communist and Maoist groups, like recently. And there's also a lot of, the Zoomers are coming of age. There's a lot of internet autodidacts. There's stuff about leftist content on YouTube, uh, Twitter, et cetera, et cetera. But there's not many new organizations and Trump is most likely going to be elected in this upcoming year, and I don't think the squad is going to expand. That's the landscape of the American left right now. So I want you guys to give me an honest assessment where it's going in the next 10 to 20 years. That's for everybody. <laughs> well, sure, I'll have at it. Uh, the, the nowhere good, I don't think, <laughs> the left. I, I think that, um, a Trump presidency looks likely, as you say. Uh, there's something called Plan 2025, uh, which is actually a Heritage Foundation plan, but people in the Trump administration are going to try to push that um, to politicize uh, and undermine many of the regulatory functions of the state. Uh, many of the things that all of us, I don't think there's anybody here who remembers the New Deal period of the 1930s or before, so everybody here, uh, have been living with certain expectations uh, about what the political landscape might look like in the United States, what role the state plays in people's lives. I think it's not for certain that that's gonna be upended and we're, there's no way we're gonna be thrown back into the 19th century, right? But I think that the left that exists today is going to be incapable of fighting under the, the, the terms that seem as though they're being said, not just by Trump, but like an entire wing of, the, of capitalist class politics, uh, starting of course in the executive and legislative, but increasingly now in the judicial, which is something that's gonna be around for probably a generation or so, right? So what, what might, not a left, but like a socialist uh, movement or organization or set of institutions offer? Well, they certainly couldn't offer um, 
defend the democratic rights of the past or defend the, the victories of the working class from the 1930s, defend the National Labor Rights, uh, the Na National Labor Relations Act, when not only are these things under threat, but also they haven't functioned in a, in a uh, positive way for organized labor or the working class in this country for at least 50 years, and you could argue from the very, very beginning, as they were the liquidation of an independent union movement, working class movement into the popular front and into the Democratic Party. So we could be really dire and dour about what things are gonna look for the left wing of the Democratic Party, what they're gonna look like for the DSA, what they're gonna look like for people who continue to uphold the popular front. But I think as socialists, we need to accept that the continuing destruction of, of um, the ability to imagine a, a, a popular alliance between, let's say, progressive forces in the working class or progressive forces and the socialist left uh, is, is going to continue. All, it, it can actually be a positive thing, I think, if we can try to move past some of the dead weight of the last uh, 50 to, to 60 or 70, 80 years. But that, I think, in the next 10 to 20 might mean uh, a lot of trouble in the meantime and a lot of disorganization that we need to organize ourselves through. Well, you're asking for a prediction, and I guess the easiest thing to predict is more of the same. You know, movements will be up and down, organizations will come and go, and we'll be uh, in situations like a lot of a lot of you know activities, at least at the local level, police do something stupid and you know bad, and, and people react, and there's a little movement for a while. Uh, there are bigger issues like the climate. Uh, we have somewhat revival right now of, of labor struggles, not come low in historical perspective, but higher than it's been in, in, in recent years. So these things will go up and down, and the organizations with them will go up and down unless we get a perspective of building a mass party. And what it can do is connect issues and connect constituencies into a stronger movement. And uh, with ranked choice voting, particularly proportional representation, give representation and uh, legitimacy in, in the political world and some longevity and the ability to win some reforms, which at some point, reforms come into conflict with the capitalists who decide this is too much, like they did with Allende. And that's a whole other uh, thing you have to prepare for. But like I was saying about the problems of having a mass party, that's one of them we should, we should wish for. Can I pass it on to you? Thank you. Um, well, so first of all, I think it's better of a hybrid to only ask about the American left, to be honest. Um, same as when you said earlier on uh, that the new left was funded by the CIA. I also think that there's something, somewhat of an American hypothesis, so a lot of times a counter when speaking to like American leftists, because sometimes they forget that there's like revolutions or that the new left was like popped up all over the world and can't all be funded by the CIA. Um, but at the same time, um, I think I would um, agree with what a lot of what Howie just said. I think it also it's just going to be a lot of the same. I think especially uh, the war in Israel Palestine is definitely going to politicize, or maybe not. That's a question. It doesn't mean politicize, but like there's going to be a lot of protest politics because of that. And a trend that I also definitely see in Germany is that the urgency of the climate crisis actually drives people into more like ideological sectarianism in a way. So people feel so scared by it, and also like the Zoomers like grew up with this like impending sense of doom that um, they just turn to activism. When I talk to them, I just feel like I'm talking to someone from Scientology, basically. <laughs> it's really that intense, and I feel like that's going to happen a lot more in the following years because the urgency is real and we haven't, like, the left just seems to be lost for answers um, in terms of that. Um, I have tiny hopes. I feel like um, recently I've noticed a lot of more like news about worker strikes all over the globe. 
Like, I feel like you've had a few in the last years, especially here in America. We're having some in, um, we're having some in Germany at the moment as well. And for example, there's like Italians that just took over a car factory, um, um, which is also really impressive. So like these tiny things give me hope, but in general, I think the future is pretty dire. It was a wise organization that once said, the left is dead, long live the left. <laughs> the, uh, I don't know about the second part, but the first one, yeah. Um, well, it depends on, what's understood as left, I, I, I don't see any hope for it. Um, we look at the historical analysis of what left meant, you know, the forces of progress. There will be perhaps a, a new left uh, that will be uh, constituted. Um, the contradictions are, are developing, uh, they're heightening, and uh, there's nothing more foolish to think that something's not going to pop at some point in some form. Uh, there will be a nodal point uh, as these things uh, continue to happen, and I think that what's going to occur, if I can get the magic eight ball out and start predicting stuff, is that new forces will arise that the left will condemn as heretical. Uh, that they will shitsling uh, names to, all sorts of different names, and um, ultimately, these forces, I think, will perhaps be victorious, and uh, we'll see what that left does then. Does it stand with uh, the forces of reaction and empire and the forces that want to conserve the old order, or will it decide to perhaps, you know, admit that the shitslinging they did was not well warranted, was a little bit dogmatic, and perhaps join these? these forces at some point so I think uh, yeah I, I think new forces will pop up perhaps uh, sooner rather than later okay Carlos if you take issue with the formulation of where the American left is going in the next 10 to 20 years now ask the alternate formulation where is the American working class going in the next 10 to 20 years do I have a, a right to answer that in terms of the time yeah. Yeah. oh Oh, sorry, I'm trying to do nice. <laughs> Well, uh, I, I think the working class is continuing to mobilize. What we have in the, in the, the trade union movement is, uh, his, his question for, uh, was, you know, where do I think the, the, the working class is going in the next decades? I think they're going to continue to realize that it's, uh, it's, it's organize and fight or continue this decline into misery and precarity that uh, no one wants to experience. I'm very hopeful by the uh, Sean Fain phenomenon in UAW. I'm very hopeful by the Sean O'Brien phenomenon in, in the Teamsters. I'm also very hopeful for the, uh, the, uh, the Amazon Labor Union and the Chris Smalls phenomenon in Staten Island. And I think that uh, there's many other similar cases where we've seen a you know, skyrocketing in, in unionism and um, you know, just the, the polls that come out uh, as to how working people feel about unions, there's, there's definitely been a real perception shift uh, from unions or just these corrupt uh, organisms that just want to take our dues and, and uh, just go play golf with it <laughs> uh, to, you know, we can win some serious deals with this. And um, the victories of the Teamsters and the victories of the UAW recently with this historic uh, stand-up strike, a surgical strike uh, that was, uh, you know, quite ingenuous in, in terms of uh, labor, trade unionist, uh, militant history. I think that's only going to have a positive feedback loop on these tendencies for unionization. Um, and I mean, you hear Sean Fain talk, it's, it's very close to, 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 to socialism. He, I think, resembles uh, very much the legacy of Walter Ruther, um, who wasn't fully there uh, uh, for, for me as a communist, but was almost there in a lot of key areas. And if if communists were better at that time, um, and I'm here, I'm drawing from the, my guy over here. Um, if communists were better at that time, I, I think uh, uh, Walter Ruth or someone that could have been pulled in, and I'm having perhaps the, the same hopes for, for Fain and, and O'Brien and others. This will be our last question, so if you can also weave in some of your closing remarks right here. Okay. Okay, so my question is regarding um, socialism with American characteristics. Uh, which both Sean and Carlos mentioned. Uh, it seems to me to be like a valorization of failure. Uh, the IWW failed, Debs failed, the anti-war movement failed to become a workers' movement. 
Bill of Rights, Socialism, Failed, etc. America's left revolutionary history is a history of failure and capitulation of capital. Uh, to me, at least, how Carlos speaks of it is as an aesthetic principle to appeal to right-wing workers. Uh, my question is simple. Um, socialism with, what is socialism with American characteristics, and what principles does a mass party organized on American socialist lines look like? Thank you. Um, I agree there's been a lot of failures, but um, at, at the Institute, we have you know the heads of, of Marxism. We have our Marx, Engels, Lenin. Can anyone guess who the fourth head is? The boys. So someone said Sana. That's a good guess. <laughs> du Bois. It's W.B. Du Bois. Um, uh, because unlike most uh, labor historians who have a, a white blind spot, um, I think that uh, that Du Bois is correct. You know, the far, the uh, front lines of the struggle has been the struggle for the Black Freedom Movement. So I have a very big difficulty describing such a revolutionary event, such as the Civil War where the workers literally freed themselves through a general strike, the black proletariat, as Du Bois calls it, and established a dictatorship of labor for nearly a decade. We celebrate the Paris Commune every single year, lasted three months. God bless them, you know, we, we should celebrate it. But we had a goddamn dictatorship of labor here in the US South, led by the Freedmen's Bureau, and it lasted a decade. And the most important American intellectual in our history, W.E.B. Du Bois, has written about it in, in, in uh, in the most precise and clear way, and we're still, you know, uh, almost uh, 90 years after Black Reconstruction, we're still not paying attention to, to this legacy. Uh, that's why we can't understand our national past. We can't understand what the civil rights movement meant, how it was the third American revolution, and uh, it, it leads us into these forms of thinking that are just incorrect. So I would say, no, the history of American struggles has not been a history of failure. Even the utopian communities, Modern utopian socialism is basically born in America. It's basically born in America. You look at the utopian experiments that Marx and Engels are looking at, drawing from. Owens, St. Simone uh, communities, uh, Fourier communities, all of them, or the vast majority of them, were in the US. Um, so we have a very rich history of socialism. We have literally attempts, this is what some of my work has been focused on, Cornelius Blatchley, Langdon Billsby, and many others in the 1820s, late 1820s, trying to develop a systematic analysis of the capitalist system because they became critical of utopian socialism. The idea that you can just make these communities separated from the system you live under and then somehow succeed. They were critical of that. They wanted to understand the system as a whole and see how from within the system itself you can create a new society. What is that, folks, if not scientific socialism? 20 years before Marx and Engels. So, uh, we have as rich a legacy of, of, of socialism as any other country. It's been the McCarthyite lies that has led us to believe that we don't. Um, and, and part of what's central, I think, to the efforts of our institute is uh, showing and highlighting that history that gives historical legs to the movement that we have today. We're not just fighting for the present. We're also fighting for the future. But when we fight for the future, we're also fighting for the past. We're providing a rereading of the past and making sure that those people that fought some died, some were in prison, some lost jobs, some were deported, that all of their struggles did not go in vain. We're fighting to secure a past as much as a future and a present. And uh, we can't do that if we have this national nihilism that says, oh, our history is just a bunch of failures, imperialism, genocide, slavery, and everything else. Let me get brief closing remarks. Yeah, I find it hard to disagree with, with most of that right there. I think that the American revolutionary tradition uh, has failed just as Everyone else has failed in the entire world. We, all we could do is pick up the pieces and not look to the past, but look to the future while informing ourselves of the way in which socialists in the past fought under uniquely uh, American con conditions. You say Bill of Rights socialism failed. You know, you're talking Browderism of the, of the 1930s, uh, I believe. I mean, there's some really interesting attempts right now um, within the DSA and outside the DSA to try to bring a sort of Republican uh, Marxist view uh, forward, trying to throw up constitutional conventions, for example, right? I don't go all the way down that route, but I feel like more and more people in the United States are recognizing this deep American tradition that we have and understanding that, you know, while Lenin has a lot of actually very interesting things to say about America, as do like, Marx and Engels, right? that um, there's something about the American revolutionary tradition that's different 
our bourgeois revolutionary tradition, whether that's 1776 or whether that's the 1860s uh, and early 70s, um, that means that in this country, a lot of, um, you know, a lot of people say, well, we're all settlers, settler colonists in this country, and that that's why we don't have any revolutionary potential. And it is true that there was settler colonialism in this country, and the after effects of that still exist. But we also have a, a, a frontier mentality in the course of the, the various genocides and expropriations that happen. Uh, that legacy is a bloody one and a genocidal one and a disgusting one, but also made us kind of who we are. And there's a freewheeling optimism uh, and a real jealousy of one's rights um, and freedoms in this country that right now are only being validated and only being expressed by the petty bourgeoisie and the bourgeoisie in their two parties. I think that American uh, socialism with American characteristics would rhyme with a lot of um, uh, what the Amer average American worker uh, considers their freedoms and rights to be. It would just, our task is of course to make those understood as class rights, something that, that can only be conquered through a class movement. So I'm not all that di dire or dour about America, honestly, in our tradition. I don't know, Howie, do you want to? Yeah, I've been thinking of that Gramsci quote, you know, pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. I mean, there's been a lot of pessimism in the discussions this weekend, and we need to bring the optimism too. Um, and I would say we haven't failed, we just haven't succeeded yet. Um, it's a long struggle. We're talking about change, fundamentally changing, you know, the dominant social system in the world today. So uh, let's not beat ourselves up too much. Um, but what I come back to is, okay, what do we do? And I say we need to organize organizations. I'm talking about a mass party, the trade unions, uh, community organizations, and I'm talking about membership organizations where people agree with the purpose and principles and they fund it with dues. We got a problem of foundation or government funded non-governmental organizations, nonprofits, and some of them and I could get into names and what's going on, but I won't, are funded just by people that are rich, uh, funding their own or they're funding other people's uh, nonprofits and distorting the politics in a non-democratic way because they got the money, uh, which, you know, is a problem in bourgeois democracy, even if some of these people are playing politics on the progressive side of the street. So um, I guess, you know, what I, another slogan, don't mourn, organize. <laughs> um, so to be honest, I'm really not too deep into American socialism to actually give like a proficient answer to this. So when I'm thinking, but uh, maybe I can relate a bit to what can we learn from German socialist events. So I think there's still a lot to be learned from the Second International in pushing forward, being like very prominent and like. Um, making sure that it is socialism that we are talking about and also making broad strategic alliances that like connect not only the working class people, also the non-working class people. And I think that's something that we still see in like our politics today, or that could be useful. And I don't know, it's maybe not the best example, but like even from the GDR, there are some things, you know, that are left over where I would say, hey, so, you know, women were um, liberated much more earlier than uh, um, in, the, in, in West Germany. And so there are some things that we could still learn or like inherit from that and I think one of the things that we are pushing as an organization at the moment as I already said is to bring back socialization or like the socialization of property and actually having people asking the question of why is there private property again and that happened in the GDR and that sucked like majorly but I do think that we should find a new socialist way to talk about these things and issues. Thanks. Give our uh, panelists a round of applause.